thank you very much. And uh, so first of all, thank you, Deanna. And uh, just a big welcome to everybody that have joined us today for our preview day. Uh, so happy that you uh, are, are, first of all, that, uh, that you applied to Iowa State University. And second of all, that, uh, that you either have an offer in hand or in some cases are on our alternate list. And uh, I, I just wanna mention that that really um, is, is, a, is, a, is a wonderful step in your, in your journey to becoming a veterinarian. And you know, what a wonderful profession that you, are, that you are aiming for. And I just wanna thank you for considering Iowa State as the place that you want to continue your, your, your education. So uh, just kind of scanning down through where everybody's from, just, just, uh, just really incredible where folks are coming from. I've got, I see folks from Florida to North Dakota, from California to Maryland. I see we have a couple folks here from, uh, from uh, Brazil and China. They may be living in the United States right now, but uh, their, their home countries are uh, around the world. And, and I think this just, uh, just kind of highlights um, the applicant pool that we get here at Iowa State University, it's, it's really a national applicant pool. And in fact, it's a global applicant pool. And uh, I think uh, that, that's just one more highlight of the excellence that we have here at Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine. So again, I just wanted to thank you and welcome you. Um, I'm gonna share a PowerPoint here, uh, Deanna. I, uh, if you, once I share this, if you can just tell me that it's working, that would be good. Should be coming up here in a second. Do you see that, Deanna? Uh, yep, I see it. Awesome. Still see it? Yep, definitely. Right. Very good. So um, I just want to share kind of a few points of pride. And uh, and by the way, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to drop a question into the drop box. I'll, I'll let uh, kind of Deanna kind of monitor that. If there's a question that pops up, Deanna, just stop me and, and we'll answer it at that point, okay? Sounds great. So first of all, one of the things that you may not know is that... Uh, is that Iowa State is actually the first public college of veterinary medicine in the United States. And then, and in fact, this past year in 2019, um, actually now two years ago now, uh, we celebrated our 140th birthday. And so this just speaks to, the, to, to really the legacy of, of Iowa State in producing veterinarians to serve, um, to serve animal owners and animal and humankind, not only here in Iowa and the United States, but but really around the world. So just an incredible legacy of training veterinarians and scientists, providing service, providing research, providing the education to really meet the needs of society. We're one of the best colleges of veterinary medicine too, as, uh, as you all probably know. Uh, in fact, if you look at rankings around, uh, around the world within the United States, we're, we're ranked in the top third of all colleges of veterinary medicine. And then when you look around the world, we're, we're ranked in the top quarter. So again, just speaks to the quality of, of the education, the quality of the research enterprises here, and most importantly, the quality of the people that we have here in our College of Veterinary Medicine. We have state-of-the-art facilities, and, and I know you're gonna get a tour of the facilities later. Um, our hospital, uh, the Lloyd Veterinary Medical Center is about 10 years old and just, just really uh, state-of-the-art facilities, which we continue to, to continue to update and grow and expand. Um, this past year, uh, we just, uh, this past summer, I should say, we just redid one of our major classrooms to make it state of the art uh, for, for kind of new um, versions of learning. And that, that picture is actually here in the right-hand side of, of, your, of the, the slide that you're looking at. One of the exciting new facilities that we're getting ready to launch actually next week is the, constru the construction of our, uh, of, uh, oops, that, that went ahead there of our uh, new veterinary diagnostic lab. Uh, this, is, this is a state-of-the-art facility that will serve the diagnostic uh, needs, not only of, of animal owners here in Iowa, but around, uh, around the United States. And uh, this is also an important venue for our educational enterprise as well. So this is launching next week. Just wanna mention, uh, I know you're gonna uh, talk a little bit about the, the cost of education and uh, the cost of our education here at Iowa State. But I just wanna highlight um, that we are very proud that, that we work hard to keep our cost of education uh, as low as possible. We understand that the cost of veterinary medicine education is high to begin with, um, and, but we work hard to try to make sure that we keep that as low as possible. So this is just a, a slide that looks at the cost of non-resident uh, 
uh, total cost of education for non-resident students across all colleges of veterinary medicine here in the United States. And, and what you'll notice is that uh, Iowa State is in the lower uh, third of all colleges of veterinary medicine for non-resident students. And for those folks that are from Iowa, uh, it's even lower. So it's in the, in the lower five or the fourth uh, lowest of all uh, in-state tuition. So again, this is our commitment to our students uh, to do our very best to keep the cost of education, the overall cost of education as low as possible. We, one of the things that we're working really hard uh, to do to try to, to, try to uh, facilitate keeping that cost of education low is, is growing our scholarship uh, uh, enterprise here. And you're gonna hear from Dr. Ramirez a little bit later. Dr. Ramirez is, is, is really uh, the leader of our scholarship program here in the College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, but our goal is to, is to be able to provide $2 million in scholarships to our students by by 2023. Um, this year in 2021, uh, we're going to give away about $1.3 million in scholarships to our students. Again, our commitment to trying to make, uh, make the cost of education as low as possible for our students. Um, you know, uh, one of the important things to know is that when students graduate from Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, they're, they're highly employable. And in fact, uh, and this is from our 2019 uh, AVMA survey of our graduates, 98% um, of our students had a job or a job offer uh, when they graduated in May. The national average is just about 95%. So again, just speaks to the quality of our graduates and the fact that employers um, are actively seeking them out. Uh, number of offers that our students had in 2019 was almost three offers per student. And uh, Dr. Ramirez may, may talk about this later, but I know the students right now that are, that are looking for jobs that are getting ready to graduate here in May of 2021 um, are getting lots and lots of different offers. And then starting salary of our students is about $79,000 uh, nationally from the Saving May survey in 2019. The national average was about 70,000. So again, our students that are graduating are getting, not only getting offers, but getting good offers uh, of employment. Uh, and, you know, importantly, um, our, our college is, is, is focused on solving uh, important animal and public health problems, okay? And this is, this is primarily through our research enterprises. So things like antimicrobial resistance, uh, neurological diseases, um, you know, pet, pet health problems, uh, production animal health problems. Uh, we are committed to solving these problems, providing information to stakeholders, uh, animal owners, farmers, to help them take care of their animals and provide for the health of their animals. And again, not only on the animal side, but also in public health. And, and I'm sure you all are aware that veterinarians, you know, certainly have an important role in animal health, but, but equally have an important role in public health as well. I also want to mention that we have a commitment to diversity, uh, not only within the, within the College of Veterinary Medicine, but within the veterinary profession. Uh, our profession um, certainly has work to do when it comes to increasing the diversity um, of, of our profession. And uh, certainly we here at Iowa State are committed uh, to that, to our role in increasing uh, diversity and inclusivity within our profession. I just want to point out one of our, one of our proudest alumni uh, from Iowa State University's College of Veterinary Medicine, that's Dr. Frederick Douglas Patterson, who's, who's pictured in the, in the lower right-hand corner. Dr. Patterson was a 1923 graduate of our college and went on uh, to have a distinguished career in, in academia, mostly at Tuskegee University where he founded the Tuskegee College of Veterinary Medicine or what is, was one of the founding fathers of that. And then, and then went on to become the president of, of Tuskegee University. And if, if you're history buffs like I am, um, and if you've studied World War II, there's a, there's a group of, uh, of, uh, uh, of aviators that were part, important parts of World War II that were uh, called the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, Dr. Patterson was one of the founders of the Tuskegee Airmen. So just a, just, a, just a wonderful person. And again, an alumni of our College of Veterinary Medicine. We also have a commitment to wellness. Again, wellness. Um, is, is a continuous issue for all of us, uh, regardless of our profession, but certainly within veterinary medicine is something that we 
uh, understand that we need to pay attention to. And so there's a variety of things here that we do to, uh, to help provide for both the mental um, as well as the physical well-being of our students, faculty, and staff. And this, this includes, uh, we have a full-time mental health counselor, uh, Dr. Lauren Young, who's, who's pictured here kind of on the right middle side of your slide. Um, we, we, have a, we have a gym uh, within the College of Veterinary Medicine, although full transparency right now, that gym is closed uh, as we deal with the pandemic, but hoping to get that back open here uh, this summer. And then there's a variety of other student-driven, faculty-driven and staff-driven uh, activities that are focused on the wellness of our community. And most importantly, most importantly, we, we just have outstanding faculty, staff, and students within our, within our community. And it, and, it, and it really takes a community uh, to meet the missions of our College of Veterinary Medicine. And those missions are educating the next generation of veterinarians and scientists. It's providing services uh, through our veterinary med uh, through our Lloyd Veterinary Medical Center and through our veterinary diagnostic lab to, to meet the needs of, of animal owners here in the state of Iowa. And, and it's also to do research and answer important questions that are important to society. And none of those missions, none of those missions could be met, could, met without outstanding faculty, staff, and students. And uh, I'm so proud of our faculty, staff, and students. I've really been proud of them during this past year as we've had to navigate COVID-19 and the pandemic. Um, and uh, I can say with confidence uh, that we've been able to do that well during this past year and, and have no doubt that we will continue to do that well as we move forward uh, through the pandemic. So with that, um, I want to end uh, because I know there's going to be a lot more exciting things to talk about today uh, with, uh, with the folks that are going to be visiting with you. And uh, Deanna, that's all I have to say. Again, just welcome to everybody. Thanks for, for uh, your application to Iowa State University. Congratulations on, on being accepted or, or in some cases on the alternate list. And we look forward to having you as part of the cycle and family. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grooms. Uh, I may wait just a, a second or two here for uh, questions. Remember that you're welcome to unmute um, and ask that question out loud uh, for Dr. Grooms if you have one or type it into the chat um, if you've got one as well. So um, so I'll, I just want to give us, I don't want anybody to feel like they're getting cut off if they're <laughs> furiously typing. Um, but otherwise, we will uh, transition to Dr. Ramirez here in just a minute or two um, as well. But uh, Dr. Grooms, wanna, oh, go ahead. Yeah, and I'll hang for a few minutes. And so if anybody wants to just ask a, you know, a question in the chat to me privately, I'm uh, more than happy to do that. But I'll hang on here for you know, 10 or 15 minutes to answer any private questions if they wish. Perfect. I appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Grooms. Okay, uh, so we will go ahead then and transition into uh, more admissions updates. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ramirez here um, to take it away. Perfect. Thanks, Deanna, and welcome, everyone. We're very excited to have you uh, sitting in today and uh, listening more, trying to learn a little bit more about our College of Veterinary Medicine. So. Um, I'm filling in for Dr. Jared Danielson, who is our Associate Dean for Academic and Student Affairs. Usually he does this part and I talk about scholarships. So I'm excited that I get to talk about both parts uh, this time. So trying to provide you a little bit of background information. So uh, just so you get a sense of applications, uh, this year we had uh, almost 2000 applicants for our college. Um, we had 176 from Iowa, 22 from North Dakota, 100 from Nebraska. We have a great partnership with the College of Nebraska. Uh, and then also about 1,700 that are, you know, non-resident or non-contract state. Um, diversity is very important to us. Uh, Dean Grooms talked about diversity in the students, but I think diversity comes in many different forms, right? Um, including the diversity in majors that we see. So we have students in biology, animal science, zoology. So uh, go ahead and uh, take pride on your uh, major and on the chat, just kind of throw in what your current major is. 
Um, just so that everybody else gets to get a sense of the diversity in those of you here, because that's important, right? The more critical we think with that diversity, the better. So biology, animal science, zoology, ecology, wildlife, those are the, the, the ones that primarily we have a bigger group. Uh, but we also have chemistry, biochemistry, microbiology, genetics, kinesiology, um, and then we have some other tiers, right? So, so great diversity um, with everyone here. So here's some additional majors. Again, you can take a look at those and see uh, all, all over, right? And I think the key thing is we have our prerequisites because that's really all you need is that basic foundation and the diversity you bring with your particular major, uh, we're excited that will help contribute to our diversity in thought and our diversity in progress at our college. Um, Age-wise, you can see our average age of our applicants is almost 24 years, um, and it ranged everything from 19 to 65, right? So it's exciting to see that even some people that might be 65 years of age are still interested in learning, right? And as veterinarians, that's a key thing for us is lifelong learning. So excited to see that. And then again, great variety of interest. Uh, we have fantastic programs in, in every species, right? If you really look at it, uh, equine, uh, mixed animal, food animal, small animal, uh, we got some great diversity in our faculty and their background and expertise. Uh, so we have a lot of um, uh, applicants who are kind of in the mixed area, whether predominantly small or large or half and half. Uh, we do have quite a few that are also focused strictly only on production and animal. Um, and then we also have some others undecided. And, uh, you know, our, our profession, that's one of the advantages of opportunities is as a veterinarian, there's so much you can do. And we'll talk a little bit about that you know, in the second half. So there's great variety of what we can do. Um, as of the 17th, as of St. Patrick's Day, uh, we had made 146 offers. Uh, at that time, we had uh, 40 so far who've accepted and 20 who had declined. Um, and then we had about 86 who had not yet answered back to us. And there's still time. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, obviously, those who accept are, are most likely those who are in state to get accepted to their in-state institution. Usually they're some of the first ones to accept right away. Um, but we do have some others that we're kind of waiting. So we still have 80 plus seats that are uh, unclaimed. So you're probably wondering where your what your status is or what your next steps may be, right? So just as a reminder, April 15th is the postmark date for applicants to have received an offer to send their acceptance and we must receive it by the April 22nd, okay? Um, this is a very important document. So when you return it, you know, you can send it, um, you, you can reply by scanning it and sending it to us initially, but then you have to still send it in the mail. Um, I think there's a check that needs to be sent with that as well. Uh, just make sure you use some type of a tracking system, right? Registered mail or something so that you have evidence that you actually sent that the deposit, uh, especially nowadays seems like the mail is a little bit slower. Um, it's kind of like the dog ate my homework. We want to believe you, but we have some legal obligations to make sure we confirm that the stories are correct. So make sure you do get some type of a tracking system so that you can document because things do get lost and, and, and we want to keep that space for you if you if you accept it. Um, what we will do is after April 22nd, right, um, all those uncommitted offers, so if we made offers and they have not responded, will be withdrawn, and then we start making um, offers to an alternate list. Okay, so some of you might be in that alternate list. Um, what we will do is we will first notify you via uh, the message board and also if you provided us your cell phone number for texting. Uh, we've learned that that's also a good, great way to, to provide you that information. So if you provide that, we will also send you a message via text. Uh, if you don't provide us a cell phone for a text number, you know, then we will utilize the message board and uh, email. Uh, so you need to make sure you're monitoring, you know, the message board, very important. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, make sure you, you continue to, to watch your phone and those text messages. I know my kids hardly ever respond. Uh, but yet when they send me a text, they want me to respond right away, right? Uh, so just kind of 
pay attention to that. And then also don't forget your email so that we can make sure that there's no miscommunication. Uh, that this first message is just an opportunity to say, hey, are you still interested? We'll give you three days usually for you to reply and say, yes, I'm still available and interested. Um, and what that does is then we uh, send you an official notification once you tell us, yes, you are available. We do that because there are some students who have been accepted to their state institutions. They don't notify us and we hate to wait a week for, to get a response. So we want to know if it's available so we can let others know right away. Once we send you the official notification, you will have five days to respond and let us know uh, whether you accept or not. And again, and that's to keep that process moving. Um, if you're kind of wanting to know where you are in the, in the, in the uh, alternate list, um, you know, Kathy Kiel, uh, she's available via chat right now. Uh, she's a great contact and she will reply to you. Uh, please just maybe contact once a week, uh, not every day. Uh, we have a lot of people we have to respond to. We have a lot of stuff to process, so we don't want to delay everyone else's application because we're spending too much time trying to reply to somebody who just asked a day or two ago where they stand. So if you can just kind of do it once a week, we, we're more than glad to help keep you posted on that. But very, very important is keep monitoring that message board. You're all familiar with that. Uh, that's part of that supplemental system. Uh, this is what it looks like, right? It has everything in green. Uh, this is the way that we will communicate with you. And that's important to us because uh, we have multiple people working right, and that way everybody can keep track of what you've been told or what has happened. Uh, so it's a one central way to keep that communication. So please, please, please check it, right? Uh, this is where you know where your status is. This is where you will get information. Um, here, Dr. Eric, um, Danielson recommends you check it at least weekly. I would strongly suggest that you pick two days of the week and you always check it those two days. That way, if you forget one day because you're busy, you still have that second day to catch it up, right? Because emails can go into the junk folder, text messages, sometimes you're busy and don't notice you get a text, right? So it is important that you keep track of that, um, especially as we get past this April 15th date so that you can have that opportunity to respond to us very quickly and not lose that opportunity simply because you were busy and you forgot to check. So. Uh, please keep us posted if you see any issues. And again, all communication, <clears throat> excuse me, please use the message board. We have that way our different staff that's in our office, um, if they're responding, they can see that history. And again, they can make sure that everybody's aware of things and not just that you talk to Danae and Kathy doesn't know, or you talk to Kathy and Dr. Howard doesn't know. This way, everybody knows what you've been what you've been told, and there's a good record of that. So, so make sure you keep on checking your emails and your junk folder. Okay, um, <clears throat> keep that communication. Okay, uh, keep that communication going um, because we do want to work with you uh, because we do want you to come to Iowa State. So again, that message board, great opportunity. Here's what it looks like. You're probably very familiar with that. Um, and then just keep sending those messages. Um, it's a good place for you to also have that information again for future references. Now, some of you are probably like, well, just I'm an alternate. I'm not sure what my chances are. Um, reality is we have limited spaces and this is true for all veterinary schools, right? Uh, we don't have that opportunity or privilege to accept everyone, right? And we limit a lot of that simply because we want you to receive the best education. So that means we have to restrict our class size to make sure that we have the proper ratios for your learning in labs and, 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 and sitting in, in, in. So it's not that we don't want to accept you. Uh, we, we would love to accept everyone, but we're really constrained on making sure that we have that space to allow you to learn the way you need to learn. Um, Dr. Danielson has used this uh, quite often. So I'm sure some of you are familiar with uh, Apollo 13, right? Uh, great expedition, very challenging times. Uh, what you might not know is, you know, if you look at our different members that ended up going, Jack Swigert, which was the command module pilot, uh, Jim Lovell uh, was a commander, and Fred Hayes, which was involved in the lunar model 
module pilot. Out of all those, uh, Swigert was actually a backup for the command module pilot. Um, there was a last minute change inadvertently. Um, Ken uh, Mattingly got exposed to possible measles, the German measles at that time. So there was a last minute uh, substitution into that alternate, right? And he was ready. And we all know that he and everyone else there perform and did everything just as equal. So just because you are in the alternate doesn't mean anything in the context of your abilities or anything. It's just, unfortunately, we're limited in space, but we would absolutely love you to be part of our team. So as you're preparing to come to Iowa State, uh, you will receive uh, ISU ID number. Um, it will be on your status page. Um, and then you can go ahead and sign up for a parking pass once you're registered for classes, okay? Um, and don't worry, we got parking for everybody at VetMed that needs parking at VetMed. So that has not been an issue. Um, you can go right there to our homepage under students and then under entering class and you can kind of see all this information and how you'll, you know, how you'll proceed for your IDs and all that relevant information for you. So um, we would be love to have you be part of our team here at Iowa State. So what, what to expect? Um, you know, vet med is a, is a challenging curriculum, okay? Um, there's a lot of information you need to learn. Um, here's the fall semester of 2017, right? Pre-COVID, we, we anticipate for your class would be very similar. We are splitting some of our labs into smaller labs anyway, uh, but it gives you a sense that you're gonna have a busy day, right? And that you're gonna have a busy week, five days a week. Um, our curriculum is set up. You can see here your first semester, um, you're gonna have some anatomy. Um, you're going to have some histology, some physiology, some radiology. There are some clinical skills that you're going to start learning, some hands-on opportunities, um, some case studies. So we're starting to integrate some of that background and trying to look at scenarios so you can see the applicability of what you're learning. Um, you're going to have um, lots of labs. You can see the labs are the ones with the arrows. There's a lot of them because you know, different groups split into different labs, right? So not, not every day, but pretty much you can count eight to five almost every day. You will have some breaks, you know, you, you'll be focused on, on learning the material. We have a lot of support. It's quite doable. Um, you know, this first semester, you'll be taking about 18 credits, okay? Uh, second semester, again, continuation of the normal. So our approach is we start first teaching you what's normal. There'll be more anatomy from other species, um, start getting some more clinical information, um, start getting some immunology, um, start getting some animal welfare. So you start with the normal in that first year, the second semester, you'll have about 80, uh, not 80 credits, sorry, 20 credits. Um, so again, a heavy course load, labs are mixed up. So it's not all just lectures, it's not all just sitting in the classroom. Um, then second year, we start integrating some of the different diseases, some of the pathology. So first year, you learn all the normal things. Now you can separate what is abnormal, and then you start learning why it's abnormal, the different things, the different diseases. Third year starts the clinical. You'll have some hands-on surgeries. Um, you'll start putting scenario of the diseases back into the context of how it applies to things in the field, right? Instead of just by segment. And then the fourth year, which is all hands on the deck in our fantastic teaching hospital with our great clinical faculty, right? For 12 months. So great opportunity to go through that learning process. So don't be scared. Uh, you can do it. Um, if we're accepting you into our program, if we're considering you an alternate, is because we truly believe you're ready and prepared to jump into this exciting program and career. So here's my contact information. Um, also, Dr. Danielson's available. Uh, I know we got Kathy also available for questions. Um, so great opportunity, a lot of excitement. Um, hang in there. Things are going to start here April 15th. It's going to start happening pretty fast. Um, and then we hope we can have you join us here at Iowa State. So 
with that, Kath, um, Deanna, I'll bring it back to you. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Um, so hopefully that helps people uh, kind of understand their, their next steps and, and where they're at. So I wanna make sure we have time for questions. So we do have a little bit of time uh, for questions for either Dr. Grooms or Dr. Ramirez. So please feel free uh, to put them in the chat or come off mute um, and ask those. So we do have a question here. Approximately how many people are offered off of the alternate list? So how many people um, each year are offered off of that alternate list? Kat, I don't know if Kathy can maybe help answer. She, she makes a lot yep, of- Yep, I can, I can answer that. Thank you. <laughs> um, we usually go through about um, 250 to 300 alternates to fill our class from the non-resident alternate list. Yeah, obviously there's uh, from the alternates for in-state more of them accept, right? You know, because of the cost of education and locality, uh, we don't go through as many, but definitely out of state, we have a lot of great candidates that also have opportunities. So um, don't be nervous about what number of alternate you are. We, we do want you here. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy, and thanks, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, so question here, what does next year's uh, what is next year's schedule looking like with COVID? So I think uh, Dr. Ramirez or Dr. Grooms, whoever wants to kind of field that question. Alex, you're up. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so what I can tell you with COVID, um, we've had some very good protocols here at Iowa State, and uh, we've kept our students very safe, uh, both at the College of Vet Med as well as on campus. Um, we progress this, this current semester, this spring semester, um, all our lectures are half in person when the half of the class virtual, um, all our labs, both last semester and this semester have been in person. Um, the, the information we're getting for the fall is we're going to be back to normal in regards to capacity. So back to everybody fitting in a single classroom rather than have to split you into groups and have you only, uh, there's probably still going to be some COVID mitigations, probably maybe still some, still some mask wearing. It all depends how everything progresses in vaccinations. But uh, we do anticipate more back to normal um, where everybody can be in the classroom as well as be able to execute our hands on. Like I mentioned, some of our faculty have recognized that splitting the labs into smaller groups has been beneficial. So we're exploring that option of continuing that extra work because it is extra work, uh, but as a way to continue to impact students learning much better. So hopefully we can get to a little bit more normal not 100% normal, but definitely moving in that direction. Always making sure that we're gonna be safe. So we'll see what the summer and vaccine availability uh, proceeds before we, uh, you know those final decisions are made. Great, great, thank you. Uh, so quite a couple of uh, questions here that came directly uh, to me. How and when do we register for classes? Is that a Kathy question? I'm gonna take it. Okay. Um, <laughs> actually, your very first semester, uh, Mindy Schminke, she's our uh, person that handles all the academics, uh, class changes, everything, she will register you for the first semester. And um, after that, she'll go through and tell everybody how they can register for the spring semester after that. But you do not register for classes your first semester. Mindy will do that. And then um, you will be offered a chance to add some um, electives to your schedule if you so wish. Perfect. Thank you, Kathy. And probably another one for you. Uh, do I, current ISU students keep their same net ID? Yep, they okay. do. They don't. Great. They don't have to do any of the registering for the net ID or email and everything. Everything stays the same. Great. Uh, and then um, another question here that I think uh, either Dr. Grims or, or Dr. Ramirez uh, can answer. Um, what is the class size at Iowa? And can you talk a little bit more about the parking? 
I'll, I'll talk about the parking and then I'll let uh, Dean Grooms talk about the class size and, and our relationship with Nebraska as well. So for parking, we have plenty of parking that you do have to pay for parking. It, it doesn't cost that much really compared to other institutions, um, but um, there is a process to get that, but it is available. So uh, there's a process. Um, so if you do need parking, you don't have to try to get in early to make sure you get that parking available. Uh, we do have enough parking. Uh, but also just recognize there, there is a fee associated with that. Absolutely. Perfect. And, I, and I'll just uh, talk a little bit about the class size. Uh, so um, we graduate roughly 150 to 155 students. Um, 25 of those students, though, uh, start, uh, spend their first two years at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. So we have what is called a two plus two program with the University of Nebraska, where 25 students start at, at UNL first two years, and then they come here in year three and year four. So for your first two years here, your class size actually at Iowa State is about 130 students. And then you're joined by 25 colleagues from, from UNL in your third and fourth year. So just a wonderful uh, 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 relationship that we have with the good folks at uh, University of Nebraska and, and Ted's uh, some wonderful uh, added diversity to our class in that third year. Um, Dan, if I may, um, a couple of private questions came to me that I thought would be just nice to share with everybody as well. Yeah. I had one question um, about uh, the opportunities in public health. And, uh, and uh, actually, Dr. Ramirez can talk a lot about that because he has a master's in public health. But uh, I do want to just let everybody know that we do have an opportunity for a dual degree dual DVM and master's in public health with the University of Iowa. We have a great relationship with the University of Iowa in, um, in Iowa City. I just put in the chat box the link to that program. So if anybody's interested in kind of that dual degree program, uh, you can look at that opportunity. Um, and, then, and then also certainly throughout our curriculum, uh, we, have, we have didactic classes in public health. Uh, and then certainly in your fourth year, there are opportunities to engage in public health clinical rotations uh, as well. And uh, again, Dr. Ramirez has a master's in public health, so he can maybe talk a little bit more about that. The other thing is uh, I was having a little private chat with somebody um, who has, uh, I saw that their dual degree or they have a, a undergraduate degree in, in uh, music. And so I was just kind of chatting with her. Next Saturday is uh, we actually kind of interestingly we have our uh, our annual um, talent show here in the College of Veterinary Medicine on, on Saturday I believe and uh, I don't know uh, you all may want to ask the students if that's available online if it's going to be uh, it's going to be uh, 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 Zoom or or webcast Alex I don't know if you know or or Deanna if you know it's going to be available but. Somebody oh, asked no. if it's going to be available. I don't know, to be honest with you, but I, I would encourage everybody to ask the, the students when you talk to them later. Uh, to see if that's, mm -hmm. that's all I had. And I got to take off because I got another engagement. So uh, I'm going to check out and uh, everybody have a wonderful morning here as you visit uh, Iowa State's College of Veterinary Medicine. So thank you. Perfect. Thank you, yeah. Dr. Grooms. Uh, if I could just make a yep. comment on the master's in public health, um, that program's designed so you don't have to decide before you start Iowa State. So they actually have you wait till after you get this first semester done. Uh, it's important that vet med is your priority and make sure you adapt to the curriculum and environment and all that. And then you can start that program your second semester or even after that. But if you start within the second semester of your first year or your second year, uh, you're able to uh, accomplish everything with minimal, extra, you know, you take one extra course per semester. There's a couple summers you have maybe an intense three, four week program, uh, but then graduate by the time you graduate with your DVM also with your MPH. So it's a great opportunity. I did my program through that program, but after uh, veterinary school. So I came back after practice up to 10 years of practice and then did that training. Uh, great program, I really loved it. Great, thank you, Dr. Ramirez. And I know um, at least one of our students on the student panel is uh, currently or just completed the um, MPH while in uh, her DVM. So um, she'll be able to answer questions too. So wonderful, wonderful. Dr. Ramirez, I thank you for uh, spending the morning with us and I know we'll see you a little bit later uh, this afternoon too. So. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your attention. And we'll talk to many of you hopefully this afternoon. Yes, great. Um, so one of the one of the unique things um, about Iowa State is our a mobile home neighborhood that is really close to the vet school. Um, and a lot of students actually purchase um, homes or rent out rooms um, in those uh, mobile homes. Um, so currently with the fourth year students heading off into the world and all of those jobs that Dr. Grooms talked to us about, um, there are some homes for sale, some folks looking for new roommates and all of that. So the link I'm putting in the chat is to a Google Doc, uh, a, a, essentially a slideshow with a bunch of different advertisements for homes. So typically when we're here in person, we do something called the Parade of Homes after you know um, our preview day, well, now you get to do it all virtually. So feel free to copy and paste that link. It'll be live for a long time. Uh, so you can uh, peruse some of those, uh, those homes available. Right now though, it is time for um, us to kind of virtually stretch our legs and take a, a tour of the building. Um, so we are going to go ahead and get started with our current students. Um, and um, I'm excited to, uh, to see the building through their eyes, even if it is virtually. Um, so I know, let's see, Maya, I think is first up. So when, uh, when they're all set to go, we will, you guys, you all can take it away. Oh yeah. Yep, that is. Okay. There you are, I see you. <laughs> Are we on? Yes, okay. we're live. Hello, my name is Maya. I'm a current second year here at Iowa State. I'm a native from California, and I have an interest in small animal medicine. Hi, I'm Bianca. I'm a third year. Um, I'm from Orlando, Florida, and my interest is also small animal medicine. <laughs> Technical difficulties. My name is Danielle. I'm originally from Chicago. Um, I'm also a third year student and also have an interest in small animal medicine. All right, so to start the tour, we want to show you this brand new costume that the school had uh, built for us over the pandemic. It's pretty big. It fits, I think, I don't know how many people fit in here, but all the classes can easily fit in here. Brand new screens, tables, desks, and everything. Oh, so well, Danielle's doing a nice pan of it. Um, it has beautiful chairs in it and a nice area that everyone can come in, plug in their computers, charger, so you don't have to worry about your computer dying on you during lecture. It always does. <laughs> exactly. Um, walking out, brand new painted hallway. So now we're going to go down this lovely hallway, which on the on my left, so on your right, we'll have the Office of Academics and Student Affairs, which is where people go to talk to Dr. Howard if you have any questions. Club D is right here as well. They also have lots of candy. Yes, can get the candy. <laughs> sorry, um, you, uh, uh, sorry, Maya and yeah. Danielle. Can you just talk and maybe say one more sentence about OASA? You cut out there, so I want to make sure students understand what that is. Sorry. <laughs> Sure. Um, so since we are separate from main campus, OASA is where you can go for all of your financial aid needs, scheduling, notary. Um, we also have a clinical therapist here at school. Um, since vet school and living away from home and pandemics and life is hard, um, she's always there and is a great resource. Um, there's also always candy. So make sure to stop in and say hi to people to get candy. Thank you. All right, so then if you keep walking down over here is where we have our library where you guys would come in to study or you can come in in the middle of your day to, um, not to take classes, not all people are studying in here, but come in during your day to just take a little break in between classes or if you do want to study or have your lunch in here, I like to come in here during my lunch breaks and watch Netflix and Hulu in between classes. So it's a good way to have some downtime. There are quiet spaces over there to study as well. If you don't want to be with a bunch of people and sit at your own little cubicle, you're more than welcome to do that down there as well. And I believe the library is open every single day of the week, including weekends. 
on Saturdays, they open around, I think, eight or 10. Uh, about nine. Nine, of course. And then Sunday, it's also late. So if you want to study over the weekends, you're more than welcome to. The library is open at all times. And then during finals, also open for extended hours. We have billboards on both the left and right. Um, we have different clubs, uh, different clubs do, such as SAVMA, uh, ABP, Cal Club, Cal Club, yeah, <laughs> Royal Canaan, uh, OTS, OTS, which is the school fraternity, which is also a nice professional fraternity as well. Uh, we do work with Karina Hills and Royal Canaan, so if you do have animals that you bring to the school with you, we do have feeding programs, so you do get a nice discount through the school to give your animals prescription diets or regular diets, depending on what you want with your animals. We also have more clubs on this side. We have over 40 clubs in total, um, and these are great opportunities to attend lunch meetings and wet labs. Um, based on your interests, whether it's exotics, cattle, equine, surgery, emergency, um, business, there's a club for everyone and they're great outside of class opportunities. Yeah, it's a good extra way to get more hands-on experience outside of the anatomy lab, outside of surgery lab, if you're interested in doing more specifics. If you have an interest in dentistry, we do have a dental club, or if you're interested in working with exotics, we do have a reptile club and an exotics club. Over here, we have our very new general doctor Okay, where we have what's your bike so you can bring your own lunch, you can conduct yourself. We also have vending machines. So if you want to get another snack or water, fridge in the back for you to bring your own lunch in. The general doctor cafe is open Monday to Friday, and it has coffee, sandwiches, uh, made to, we had before COVID had made to order food, but now it has a pre made food, which is great. Especially when I forget my lunch, I'm stressed out in the morning because I have an exam. And then, yeah, <laughs> uh, this nice area to study, which is beautiful because there's nice windows here. So it's lovely even during the day that you can actually get some sunlight and be able to look outside and not be stuck inside four walls all day. It has whiteboards and everything that are, are transportable, so you can take the whiteboard with you to a table. And there are Quiet study spaces in here. So if you did want to be with area with the window, we do have these special private, I guess, suites that you can call them. And we do have these lovely chairs that you can study at so that you're not sitting in an uncomfortable desk and chair all day long. These new art installments recently as well, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we can. Okay. So another classroom that we have over here is this lovely classroom. <laughs> also similar to the one that we had before, but this one's a little bit more tiered so that regardless of where you're sitting, you'll be able to see the front. We have screens. We have TVs in the back, so if you do decide to sit in the back, you're still able to see what's on the screen, what the professor is pointing to. There are echo captures in here, so if you do end up missing a lecture for whatever reason, you can go back home and watch it at later at a later time. And we, we recently revamped our fish tank lobby. So now we have a nice more study spaces over here, which is great because before it was a little, getting a little crowded in the library. So in addition to the general doctor cafe, we have these nice areas over here to study. Also with the TVs that you can plug in your computer and so that you can project whatever you're showing on your screen to your group mates or to yourself if you want to be bigger. Uh, we do have these seats over here. So when we have fundraisers or anything like that, Bake sales are on here, or any other club doing their own promotions are here. We have a beautiful Iowa State College of Vet Med sign. Maya, why is it called the fish tank lobby? Because we had fish tank, we <laughs> have a fish tank over here. Uh, I don't know, are fish still in there? No. Uh, we're currently trying to get the water quality to bring the fish back. Um, hopefully they'll be back by the fall because we all miss them. <laughs> yes. As mentioned, why was it called the fish tank lobby? <laughs> all right. 
And now we're going to go downstairs. Which is a majority of first year spend, I believe, 80% of their time, if not more. Those of you who are a little bit squeamish, I will warn you. We do have first years in there right now who are studying for an upcoming anatomy exam. So if you are squeamish, feel free to look away. We also let you request that you don't screen grab or screenshot anything that you see in there. Just in case the people of the internet are not comfortable with anatomy assessment. So the anatomy lab is also open at all hours of the day. You can come in there after hours to study, bring out your own specimens, go in there by yourself, go in there with the group. You're more than welcome to come in there whenever you feel like study. It should just be open. Okay. Okay. So it's small animal anatomy, first semester, large animal anatomy, second semester, which is why there's large animal specimens out right now and not cats or dogs. Um, the anatomy lab is a really great resource for our first year students since they get hands on dissection. Um, they get to see the dissection specimens up close and personal, as well as learning how to handle the different surgical tools that we use for dissections. Normal anatomy. Normal before after. And then one thing that's really cool when you leave the anatomy lab is we have this little, uh, little we have this piece of skulls that shows different dog breeds, different skulls, what they look like. So I like to look in here and look like German Shepherd since that's what my favorite type of dog is. But it's kind of nice to see when you see, when you learn about the anatomy of the different breeds and learn about what different skull shapes look like. It's nice to be able to actually see a live version of it as opposed to just a textbook version. In addition to that, we also have different species and different full skeletons here, such as uh, different avian species, aquatic species. It's really cool. I think it really puts a lot of delicate effort in there. Really nice to see. We have painted skulls in here as well that I believe are used also during the anatomy lab so that when you are learning about different parts of the skull, it's really helpful to be like, okay, this is a temporal bone. Oh, this is the occipital bone. It's really nice to be able to actually pinpoint to exactly what you are learning about. And those are available to use during anatomy. I know I definitely got a big use out of them yeah. during first year for sure. And then behind me, we have another classroom. I don't need to go in there because it looks like the other one above there. But it's basically the one of this corridor. It's similar to the one that we showed you before. Do you guys want to go in there? Sure. No. Yeah. Figured everyone knows the classroom. Looks like. <laughs> also, the coldest. Yes. Yeah. And we're going to junior children? Yeah. Always bring a sweater. It's like 90 degrees to freezing in here most of the time. Especially if you're not from Iowa, it gets cold in like October. Yeah, people made fun of me for showing up with my North Face in October. But yeah, like Bianca said, bring a jacket with you. Going down this hallway is our major wow. surgery suite. Um, this is where you will be spending time a little bit during first year, where you're learning your physical skills, so your hands on physical examination skills. Um, and also during your second year, when you're learning how to do surgery. So you spend a lot of time in here, you're doing practicing the collaborative, you're practicing second semester, second year, you're actually doing live animal surgery. So you are going to be doing a neuter at second year, which is super exciting. We just did that last week. It's very exciting. You also learn how to do your anesthesia skills. Your third year is also coming in here and do various phase of neuters as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you take the spring elective, you will get to do a little bit more. And then we're going to on this side. Yeah, that's it for. And that's it in terms of the 
full first portion of the tour, and I'm going to hand it off to Danielle, who's going to go over the small animal hospital portion. Who wants to phone? Yeah. So we got a little bit of a trek to get to the small animal hospital. Um, something to keep in mind too is so our base curriculum does focus on dogs and cats um, and food animal and equine. However, there are tons of electives outside of clubs that you can take to you know, really hone your skills and your knowledge on whatever you're interested in. Um, so I know like they have three different beef electives. Um, if you're a small animal like us, in the spring of your third year, you have a lot of emergency, surgery, oncology, cardiology. Or me, who just wants for fun. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> everything while you're at school. <laughs> you know, you're only four years. Enjoy it. Um, so this long gray hallway that we're walking down now is part of our diagnostic lab. Um, so we actually have the largest diagnostic lab in the country, and there are current plans to expand the lab into its own separate building just because we handle that many cases a year. Um, cases range anything from blood work to knee crops, you need a fiscal path. Um, so it's really nice to be at a school that has kind of all of those opportunities. Deanna, do we have any questions in the chat? No questions, but I uh, I wonder if Maya wants to hand the phone to you just so we can see and hear you a little bit better if you want to hold it. Yeah, that way that you can have, like the long hallway views. You can point it there. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> we'll just roll like a squad. <laughs> there um, you go. Yes, yes. Uh, so I wonder if you want to talk, Danielle, because I know you spend a lot, have spent a lot of time in the small animal hospital, like even from your first year. Um, so what are some opportunities for students even before their fourth year to kind of get involved in, in the small animal hospital or large animal hospital? Um, so there are lots of opportunities down the hospital. So if you have a special interest area, such as like cardiology or ophthalmology, um, the clinicians down in the hospital are very, very open to having students come down and shadow or hang out for an afternoon when you're not cramming for anatomy or a micro or something. Um, so you can always email professors. They're usually more than happy to come have you. Um, other opportunities, I know the emergency club SFEX has volunteer opportunities down in the ICU. So you can volunteer two hours during the week, on the weekends, to go help the fourth years during ICU, get a little bit more of a feel, um, as well as occasionally in both the small and large animal hospital, they have um, hired positions. I worked in rehab for two years or three years. I just recently stopped since I'm going to clinics. Um, they always hire a couple of students for the ICU. Um, they always are hiring students for um, tours in the large animal hospital, whether that's equine side or food animal, as well as I know the equine club AAEP also has opportunities to help with full ICU in the spring. Um, so as we're walking, I know you guys can kind of only see me, um, but in our small animal hospital, there are different rounds rooms, um, which is really nice where our fourth year students can meet with clinicians, go over cases, go over important information, um, prior to seeing clients and everything like that. I'm going to switch the camera around. So this is our med treatment area. Uh, if you've ever worked or been in a small animal clinic, this is kind of with the back. Um, so this is a very lovely opportunity for students to work on physical exam skills, basic procedures such as bandaging, catheter placement. Um, they also work hand in hand with clinicians to work on medical records, client communications, and everything like that. Um, fourth year is great. We get a lot of hands on, whether you're small, large, mixed, equine. Um, there are tons and tons of opportunities down here in the small animal hospital. And the next room we're going to go into is called the Clinical Skills Lab. So that is a room that a lot of our first years spend some time in. We're going to flip the camera. Um, so whether it's practicing blood draws, doing suture knots on the knot boards, um, kind of any skill that is hands-on, we have down here, um, just so students can get their hands on it before they get their hands on a live animal. 
we have Bonnie, who is our equine colic model. So Bonnie actually has, if I can find it, she has real jugular veins that we can practice blood draws on, as well as she has um, all the organs that you can palpate inside of her. So students can practice rectaling a horse without actually, you know, risking the horse tearing its rectum or anything like that, or having the horse not feel well. We also have Frosty, who is our um, dystocia model. So she actually has, let me open. So she has the option to put different stages of gestation uteri inside of her. Um, she also has a calf named Frosty or Snowball. This is Frosty. So this is Frosty. We'll go see Snowflake, who is her calf. Um, Snowflake has real functioning joints. Um, so professors or clinicians can come and put Snowflake into Frosty in different positions and add a student to pull the calf. Um, for students like me who don't have a lot of cattle experience, it's really great. I'd rather practice on an inanimate cow rather than have the cow freaking out and I'm freaking out and that's not good for anybody. We also have Snowball, who is our calf-sized cow, um, who is a castration model. We have multiple models for euthanasia. We have some equine heads for equine blood draws. Um, you know, we have daisies in here for suturing, spay models, neuter models, um, kind of anything physical skill-wise you want to practice, they have down here as well as, um, you know, they will usually certify us on things before we actually get to do them. So our first year we get to do um, canine blood draws. And so they will have us check it off and make sure that we're doing the correct technique before they ever give us a, an actual dog to do the blood draws on, which is really good. So as we go further, um, so most of the time our fourth year students are down here in hospital at Iowa State. We have four different tracks you can take. The four tracks that we offer are small animal, equine, large animal, or mixed. Um, depending on your track, it kind of determines what rotations you're on. Um, so there are things such as small animal medicine, food animal medicine, equine medicine, ICU, anesthesia that all students have to be on. Um, but depending on your track, you might take more of one thing than the other. So like I'm small animal track, I will take more of both small animal surgeries, small animal ophthalmology, things like that. There's also plenty of opportunity for electives. Um, one of the electives offered is canine rehab. So this is our rehab department. Um, it is equipped with two underwater treadmills, in-ground pool, laser therapy, and different sorts of balancing balls and boards. Um, so this is like human physical therapy. Our dogs can come after an orthopedic procedure, a neurologic procedure, or if they're just old and arthritic and we can try and help them walk better. Um, there's also the opportunity during fourth year to go on externships or preceptors. So you can go to other clinics, go to other vet schools and get other hands-on experience outside of Iowa State. And we will flip this around. So we're gonna go by dermatology. So for those of you who might wanna specialize um, and like mixed animal, things like dermatology and ophthalmology are a good option. Um, so everything has skin and everything has eyes, therefore everything has skin and eye issues. Um, so as you can see from these pictures, our dermatologists have seen everything from dogs, cats, cattle, pigs, lions, tigers, bears, oh my. Um, they kind of see it all. If you ever meet Dr. Noxon, he has a very lovely mustache. Um, and if you ever see him down here, he will not stop talking about the windows um, just due to the fact that derm conditions can look different, whether it's under fluorescent light or sunlight. And we will keep going. And we're gonna enter one of our exam rooms. Um, so this is one of our 22 small animal exam rooms. Um, so we are a fully functioning hospital. And so we will have clients and patients come into the room, have fourth year students come in, get a history, um, do an initial physical exam, and then they'll go back to the rounds room and check with their clinician. 
Um, it's really nice just having the opportunity to do that before we get thrown out in the world and then we're truly alone in the exam room. Um, all the exam rooms are a little bit different too. This one has a table that can fold up to the wall if we need more room. Um, there are some that lift up from the ground. So like if you need a St. Bernard on a table, I can't lift that, let's lift the table. Um, some have stable tables. Um, ophthalmology has their own exam room with some of their tools and things like that. Um, so that's a really great opportunity. So we have this wonderful big door. <laughs> um, behind it is our stereotactic radiation machine. Um, so we, I think, are still currently only one of three vet schools that has um, stereotactic radiation capabilities. Um, other schools are currently building them, but we are currently the only one that has it. Um, it's really nice going to a school that's constantly updating things in both the academic side, such as classrooms and places to study and eat, as well as a school that also updates the hospitals regularly. Um, so that's just an addition that we can give, you know, additional treatment option that we can give for patients that might not, you know, chemotherapy or surgery might not be an option. Um, our first radiation patient was actually a therapy rat that had a non-resectable tumor that took up most of like half of its abdomen and its pelvis. So obviously if you take that much out of the rat, the rat's not really gonna be there anymore. Um, so they did, I think three or four treatments of radiation therapy on it and then um, is actually still doing well today. And that was in spring, I think that was in February of 2019 is when that opened. Yeah. So now we are going to get to the infamous gentle doctor statue. So this is the gentle doctor statue. He was carved by Christian Peterson for Iowa State and has since become an international symbol in veterinary medicine. Um, he has three distinguishing features that stick out about him. So one is that he is holding a puppy and mom is kind of looking up at it. That is just to um, symbolize how, you know, our patients can't talk. They can't tell us what's wrong or what they would like. So we really do hold their lives in our hands and it's our job to advocate for them. He also has really large hands. So vets are constantly using our hands, whether it's doing physical exams, palpation, surgery, writing or typing medical records. Um, so they are a veterinarian's greatest tool. And then it's hard to tell, but he also has really large feet. So if you guys have ever met a veterinarian, you know, they don't usually sit down. Um, they also tend to work 50, 60 hours plus a week. And so the large feet are meant to symbolize the physical endurance it takes to be a veterinarian. So as we keep walking through our small animal hospital, um, we'll kind of pass through the waiting area. Um, so we really emphasize low stress or fear-free handling here at Iowa State for both our small animal and large animal patients. Um, so one option or one thing to help that we have is we have two different dog waiting areas, two for cats, one for wildlife or exotics, and then we have one for kids since kids kind of stress everybody out. Um, they at least stress me out. Um, so that's just really nice to have because, you know, since we are a referral and specialty institution as well, you know, most of our patients don't feel good. They don't want to be here. I don't like going to the doctor. They don't either. Um, and so that's just really nice. Um, another nice thing about Iowa State is that our building is always under lock. Um, so you need your red Iowa State card in order to get into the building in certain areas of the building. Um, it's very safe. We usually also have at least a um, community officer or police officer in the building as well that does hourly rounds, especially at night. Um, so if you're ever feeling unsafe, you can always call them and they can help out. Um, we're about to walk past ICU. Um, you guys can't super see it because we're on a phone. Um, and we can't go in either just due to the critical nature of the patients. Um, but we are functioning 24 seven, 365 um, with our emergency department. Um, it's a really good um, thing and caseload that we have for our fourth year students um, since we kind of get a variety of things. Um, so with that, we're gonna switch to Bianca. I should go hold it also because they take the pictures. Okay, hi. Um, so now we're going into the large animal, well, kind of midway between small and large animal hospital. Oh, 
So just as our glass hallway, how do you flip this? <laughs> it's in the chocolate. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we call this our glass hallway. Um, basically, all of the drawings symbolize the beginning of vet med all the way to present day. So, you know, cart and buggy with horses, um, a lot of cool different radiology and other things down at the bottom. Um, that med has really come a long way. It was very male dominated um, initially, and now it's majority female dominated. So mine and Danielle's class are 8% female and 16% male. Um, here's the first woman depiction of that med in our glass hallway. Um, so I'm taking pictures right now, so I'm gonna try not to get them in the video, but um, if you can look like right over here, there's houses or mobile homes. So that is our famous trailer park. So um, a lot of students live in the trailer park. I live in the trailer park and it's a really easy walk to school. So you don't have to pay for a parking pass if you don't want to. Um, and even in the winter when it's snowy outside, people still walk to class. It's very easy to get here. It's very affordable. So that's um, one option that you can do for housing. So you purchase the trailer, you just pay a lot rent on it. A lot of people have roommates. Um, and in non-COVID times, there's student activities. We have get togethers, um, barbecues and everything out in the trailer park. So that's always a really fun time. Um, where, should we go back that way? Nope. Should we go this way? Okay. All right, so I'll just show you the rest of this depiction here. So just some really cool depictions of the profession. It's a really, really nice day out today. It hasn't been nice for us recently, but that's all right. This is kind of like the front area of the small animal hospital over that way. So everything's pretty central, it's like a large square. So now we're gonna go into the actual animal hospital. It's kind of really obvious once you're in there because everything's very big and tall and it smells like horses. <laughs> So basically we have like a giant door and then this really long hallway, who's in now? Um, so equine, food animal, basically anything that's not a cat or a dog will come in through this side of the hospital. Um, over on the right side, we have several induction stalls. So it's basically a small room. It's completely padded. That's where the horses will be induced for surgery and anesthesia. It's completely padded so that when the horse goes down, it doesn't get hurt. And if the horse runs into you and you fly into the wall, you also don't get hurt. Um, and I'm sorry for you equine people, but that's just the reality of it. So that's really nice to have. Um, they do a lot of standing surgery here and different procedures. So those are a good utility for us. Um, in the back of this hallway, we have the equine ICU, which is also another opportunity for students to work if they so choose, um, like Danielle had mentioned before. Uh, we also have a full watch every spring. So students can sign up for shifts to do full watch um, and sometimes even overnight, because uh, you know, a mayor is never gonna follow you know, the nine to five schedule of when she gives birth. So we always need somebody here watching, watching the horses and making sure that they don't need any help giving birth and things like that. Um, no matter what track you choose, there are some rotations you have to take. Um, you do have to take some kind of equine rotation, even if it's not animal. You have to take a food animal, medicine and surgery rotation, no matter if you're equine or small animal also um, here. I don't know how much you can see. Actually, you can kind of see it. This is our um, food animal standing surgery suite. So they'll bring, you know, cows and goats and llamas and 
alpacas in here and do different procedures um, if they're needed. Um, oh, that one does, okay. We have, I think three or four or five, I'm not sure, um, equine exam rooms. That's, it's basically, that's what it looks like. There's not really anything else other than the stall. So we'll put the horse in there, um, have somebody holding the head. The doctor can come in and do whatever they need to do. Um, so they'll sedate sometimes for an exam. Uh, they'll bring a portable ultrasound machine in here to do either um, pregnancy ultrasound or um, horses have a lot of uh, lameness issues as well. So they'll ultrasound the legs and things like that. You get to come down here with some of your classes as well. So uh, we got to come down here with anatomy, with repro, uh, maybe a couple other classes. And there's also clubs that'll do wet labs through here too. So you get to have a little bit of ultrasound experience, um, horse handling experience and that kind of thing before you have to do your clinics in fourth year. So there's about three or four exam rooms for horses. Um, and then, this is our food animal room. It's basically any large animal that's not a horse would come in through here. Um, so we have some holding stalls and head catches and little pens. This is kind of easier to see if I go over here. Um, so you can see these little pens here too. Um, and it's, there's not usually a lot going on in this room at any given time, just because it's, more common for the clinicians to have to go out to the field to treat these guys. It's very stressful to have to bring them in to the school. So if they do have to have some kind of procedure they can't do out in the field, they'll bring them in. Um, but this is another uh, rotation. This is the food animal medicine and surgery rotation that everyone has to take. And you can also come in here uh, with, I think we did it with repro, right? Yeah, our repro class, we came in here um, to watch breeding soundness exams. We got to do pregnancy ultrasounds and use, and we also got to watch sperm collection for artificial insemination, which is something that's really, really big here. Um, they advocate for it a lot just due to the genetics and that kind of thing. Um, so that's about it for the food animal side of it. Um, what else for that, anything? Oh, yes. So uh, I mentioned field services. Um, we have, it's also a rotation. We have clinicians that go out to the different surrounding areas and farms to work on animals. There's the food animal field services. And then we also have equine ambulatory. Um, they're very competitive to get into as a student because you do learn a lot in the field. So the rotations that you'll take your fourth year, especially if you're tracking large animal or food animal, they want you to go out into the field and get experience because um, you just see so much more. Like I said, it's pretty, not rare, but it's more common for things to be treated out in the real world versus bringing into the hospital for really major procedures. Um, so it's a little dark in here, but hopefully you guys can see, this is our radiology wing. Um, we also have a little bit more, more stuff in here. So we do have um, behind door number one, equine standing surgery. And it's kind of hard to get a horse on a table. It can be done, but some procedures can be done standing. So we utilize that quite a bit. Um, behind door number two is large animal x-ray. You can't, like I said, really put a horse or a cow on a table. Um, and I don't think there's any way you can see in that room, but basically, can you see it? No, you can't. Oh, I thought you could. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so Danielle looks, will demonstrate. <laughs> of course. Um, so in addition to the handheld x-ray machines that we have, I call this the big fancy. Um, so we can walk the horse in, lightly sedate it, and then this x-ray machine actually goes 360 around the horse. Um, so it's a lot better than trying to have like two people line up plates in the machines and everything. Yeah, it's really nice because they're so big and you you can't see as much an x-ray with a large animal um, as far as the body goes as you can in a small animal. Um, and then <laughs> this is our MRI machine behind door number three. 
um, or maybe door number four, because there's not a metal door right in front of the MRI machine. Um, that's not, it's dangerous to do that, so don't do that. Um, <laughs> Uh, MRI is really important. It um, shows you the structure, soft tissue structures that you would not really be able to see on a two-dimensional um, x-ray. So it's really useful for surgical planning. Um, in addition to CT, we have two CT machines here, which is more for um, skeletal structures, but also really good for uh, surgical planning. Um, and then we have nuclear scintigraphy, which is basically um, like radiation, type of radiation, right? Kind of. Contrast studies. Contrast studies, yeah. Um, so don't really, don't really know much about that, but we have it here. Um, and then we also have um, over, over here some small animal radiology suites. So just your regular cat dog on a table with the x-ray tube um, and imaging. So. Um, my name is Mandy Fales Williams. Um, <clears throat> I have been here at Iowa State since 1995, which is a really long time now that I think about it. Um, I went to vet school at Missouri. I um, came to Iowa State with the idea of doing a PhD and a residency in veterinary anatomic pathology. And uh, at I had married my classmate at Missouri before coming here. <clears throat> our, our goal was to come here, get the degree and move on. Um, and in the process, we fell in love with Ames, we fell in love with Iowa, um, and we've been here ever since, uh, which was not, that's not how I thought it was gonna go, um, but I have no regrets. It's been a really great place for me to grow as a pathologist, to grow as a veterinarian, to grow as a teacher. It's been a very supportive environment to learn how to teach. And uh, so I've, I've really enjoyed that. Um, my area of interest is um, scientifically anatomic pathology. Um, and I, that's my professional practices. I serve as a pathologist. So I read biopsies and I do necropsies uh, for primarily animals that have come through our hospital, at least for our necropsy service, but we get biopsies from all over the country. Um, but my area of research is actually trying to study how veterinary students learn. So I'm very interested in the scholarship of teaching and learning specifically within medical education and even more specifically in veterinary medical education because we have our own um, situation going on here so it's um it's a fascinating area of study there's a lot of problems i'd like to try to solve and uh, that's what i do in my off time um, i'm a mother of two kids so i do a lot of driving kids to one thing or another which means that i am very involved with horses and ironically ballet it works sort of so so that's me that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Thipswamy, do you want to go next? Oh, oh, can you unmute? I'm sorry. I did this last time too, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Thipswamy. I am known by students as Dr. Swamy and by my colleagues as Swamy. Uh, I graduated, um, um, I did my DBM uh, equivalent to BVSC or BVSC equivalent to DBM um, in Southern India um, in 1985. And then uh, I was practicing there while um, as a faculty between uh, surgery department and then uh, in anatomy department. So I've been teaching anatomy uh, since 1985 onwards. Um, so in 1995, I got um, a British Council sponsored Commonwealth uh, Fellowship for my uh, PhD program. So I moved there with my wife. So I was also married um, before I moved to England and I had a three year old boy at the time. Um, so um, at the University of Liverpool, I did my PhD in um, nerve injury. Um, and then subsequently I continued as a faculty uh, over there and teaching again anatomy and um, um, doing research in pain and epilepsy. So in 2012, I moved to um, CBM here um, in Ames. Um, the main attraction for me over here is has been, um, so there are great anatomists um, produced by this college. And when I was a student in India, and as a faculty, I used to refer to 
um, anatomy textbooks and histology textbooks published by um, the you know faculty in the College of Veterinary Medicine here in Ames. So uh, I thought that it is a great place to come and teach and also um, to do great research. So um, currently I am funded by uh, three grants by the NIH uh, working on um, epilepsy model mainly uh, and also organophosphate toxicity model. So my interest is uh, teaching uh, veterinary anatomy and uh, doing research on epilepsy. So regarding my um, interest outside, of course, my kids are now grown up and my son, uh, he lives in England. He's 28 years old and my daughter is um, uh, at University of Iowa. So they are away from home and like Dr. Fels Williams, I do not have the commitment to take, uh, um, so to take kids around. So if, when I, if I get an opportunity, so I would spend more time in um, uh, thinking about how best we can support our students, mainly the students' well-being. So I was part of it in the past, and um, if there is an opportunity, I will certainly be happy to get involved. So um, that is my um, interest outside my um, regular academic work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bianca, would you like to introduce yourself next? Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I was having issues, but... Great. Uh, hi, I'm Bianca. Um, I'm currently a third year student here at Iowa State CVM. Um, my background, I'm originally from Brazil, but I, uh, my hometown is considered Orlando, Florida, is what I consider it to be. Um, I did my undergrad in biology with a minor in business at the University of Central Florida. Um, and at the same university, I did my master's um, in conservation biology. Um, and then I came here. Uh, my interest in vet med is small animal medicine and exotics. Uh, likely will be going into general practice here in the next, oh gosh, year and a few months. Um, and I don't have as long of a background quite yet as these wonderful professors do. Um, but outside of vet med, um, I have two very active rambunctious dogs. So we like to go around the trails here in Ames. Um, especially on a really nice day like today. Um, the weather in Ames is pretty nice um, compared to where I'm from in Florida, where it just rains every afternoon at four o'clock. Um, so that's about it for me. I'm going to keep it pretty short and sweet. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dallas, I think you're up next. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Dallas Angelf. I am a VM1 at the Univers at the uh, College of Veterinary Medicine here. Um, I went, I'm from Waterloo, Iowa, just a small town in Iowa. I went to the University of Iowa and got my degree in studio arts um, and an emphasis on ceramics. And then I came here to the to Iowa State. Um, my interest is small animal surgery. I really hope to um, specialize after the four years here. Um, and then as far as what I like to do outside of school, um, like Bianca, I like to go around the trails with my wife and my dog and um, just explore around Ames. Great, thank you. Okay, Kate, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, my name is Kate. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I'm a third year DVM MPH student. I'm initially from Southern California and did my undergrad and actually started my MPH at the University of Arizona. So I spent seven and a half, eight years there. So I consider Arizona to be where I became an adult. And so I say that that's where I'm from. I'm interested long-term in a specialty in anatomic pathology, um, but I'm open to suggestion if that changes. Ultimately, I know that I wanna be in academia, specifically at a veterinary school. So that is the main goal. And then outside of class, I participate in various leadership and diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And I'm, as of last weekend, now the president of the National Pride Student Veterinary Medical Community. I don't also have the lengthy history that many of these professors do. So let's start. That's okay. That's an accomplishment. Congratulations on your presidency. That's great. Thanks. Uh, okay, so we will open it up to questions uh, from the crowd. So they will be in the chat box and I'll, I'll kind of uh, field those questions for you all. So go ahead and put your uh, questions in the chat box. Again, if you'd like to, just let me know if you'd like to uh, ask a question out loud. Um, 
and we can uh, we can do that as well. I'll just call on you to unmute that way too. So um, the one question we've got in the chat so far um, is, um, what is the maximum distance that you would recommend living from the university? So can you talk a little bit about where do students live? What does maybe a commute look like? Um, let's see, Kate, do you wanna go first? Sure, I currently live in the trailer park, but that is not where all of us live. M many of us do live in the trailer park close to veterinary school. For fourth year requirements, you have to be within 20 minutes, I believe, 15 to 20 minutes of a rotation if you're on call. So some people do live further away in Ankeny or Des Moines um, and they will commute. It kind of depends on your personal living situation. Some people commute from Nevada. Uh, it really just depends. I think most of us do live in the Ames and surrounding areas, whether that's a trailer or apartment complexes. But ultimately, I if you don't want to move, I would plan on sticking within that 15 to 20 minute radius. But if you're open to at least moving then closer to your fourth year or staying with friends when you're on rotations that you're on call for, you can definitely live further away. Great, uh, Dallas or Bianca, do you wanna do you wanna chime in as well? Um, yeah, I will say that uh, for my undergrad, I commuted, um, and it was like I don't know, thirteen miles, but it took like thirty-five to forty minutes to get to school just because the traffic where I'm from is pretty heavy. Um, and coming from a big city, everything in Ames to me is very close by. Um, some people that people that are from here will say something's far when it's fifteen minutes away, but um, to me that's actually really close, especially back home when it took a solid five minutes just to get out of my parents' neighborhood at any given point in time. Um, so it really depends on how you look at it. But if you live generally in Ames, you're a 10, 15 minute max drive from the vet school. Um, and if you live in the trailer park, I also live in the trailer park, um, you can walk um, anytime, um, which saves you money on a parking pass too. So it really just depends on, like Kate said, what your preference is. And uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything they've said. I actually live in an apartment complex around six minutes away from campus, so it's not that bad for me. And um, the first part of the semester, I'd actually bike to school, and then I actually got a parking pass when the snow came because the bike trail that in between where my apartment complex is and the school is actually under construction, so I didn't want to ride all the way out around. But um, I, I think it really depends also on where you're at in your life. I know a lot of different people are you know, married and have kids or they and they want to have a house and they want to be away so like um, Bianca and Kate were saying there's people that live you know in Ankeny or farther away my wife and I are actually looking out around Ames for houses right now so we're going to try to stay within 20 minutes of Ames but as far as that yeah I think it really just depends on where you're at and uh, how close you want to be perfect thank you thank you for that uh, so we have a question here um, on the dress code, can you talk about what the dress code looks like at Iowa State? Uh, let's see, I'm supposed to have picked somebody first. I apologize about that. <laughs> Bianca, do you want to talk about the dress code? <laughs> yeah, so um, it, here at Iowa State, uh, it's, I guess, pretty casual compared to some other schools that do make their students um, wear business professional dress every day. Um, basically, we just want everyone to look presentable um, jeans and a t-shirt or a sweater, um, usually bring a sweater because it gets cold, um, but no rips in your, um, your shirts, your pants, um, spaghetti straps, things like that, leggings, stay, we try to stay away from that. Um, and it is student enforced, so um, you kind of have to hold yourself and your classmates accountable. Um, in the past pre-COVID times, we had um, dress up days on Thursdays which is basically you are trying to build your business casual and professional dress um, uh, collection. So you would maybe just come in slacks and a nice blouse for girls or some girls wear dresses and heels. I personally did not, but I have classmates that did choose to do that. Um, I don't know if we'll go back to that. I'm assuming eventually we will. Right now, it's, um, since we're hybrid, we are not doing that currently, but you still wanna look presentable when you come to the school just because you never know kind of who's going to be here, um, who you're going to run into. And, um, you know, we just presentable, I guess, is the key word I'm using over and over. Um, yeah, I don't, and you want to also be comfortable because you're sitting in class all day. So try to kind of think about that as well. 
Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, any other input either from faculty or our students about dress code at all? It's pretty, I think, straightforward, but. There are also some things though in the dress code that aren't really adhered to. Like one of them is like, you can't wear hoodies. That is not something that I've ever seen enforced or like the graphics on your tees, apparently there's restrictions, but I can tell you that it's, I think more what Bianca was saying that the guidelines of being presentable is more important than like the true semantics within it. Um, you can see that I have blue hair and tattoos. So part of like your professional dress code is also overall appearance, not just like clothing. So I have seen less enforcement of like the really teeny tiny details in the dress code, as long as you're adhering to the idea of like being presentable. But right now we're, we have no enforcement of that because of COVID. Great, thank you. Uh, so I have uh, from Tim would like to ask a question out loud. So uh, Tim Moritz, if you are still on, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, I was wondering, do you, what is the percent of, and like, do you, is it more in pathology? I mean, is it more small animal or is it more large animal or what is the, the ratio within that? Great, Dr. Fails Williams, that sounds like a perfect question for you. I know this one, yay. Um, hi, Tim. Uh, so our, our necropsy caseload is pretty much from the hospital. And, and so to back up a little bit, our, our situation is a little bit unique because we have the Department of Veterinary Pathology, which I'm a member of that group. We also have the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab. And so the Veterinary Diagnostic Lab is our client outside world facing um, group. And they take in all the cases from around the state, even around the country. And here in Iowa, that tends to be primarily livestock. So that's the VDL. And students have the opportunity to go through that rotation as well. In the rotation that my department runs, uh, we we take our necropsy cases from the hospital, which tends to be primarily cats and dogs, like a lot of cats and dogs, and horses, uh, horses that might vary. Right now it's foaling season, so I was on necropsy the last two weeks. We had, unfortunately, a lot of foals because that's what foals do, and that's sad, um, which is why I'm a pathologist, because <laughs> I can't handle the sad when they're still alive. I, that was not my, my um, forte. Uh, but we also have a biopsy service and our biopsy service takes in primarily again cat and dog cases um, from around Iowa and around the country. We do see some cattle. We, um, it's been a while since we've seen many pigs. Um, but then a uh, small ruminant, so a lot of sheep, uh, llamas and alpacas also find their way to us. We also see um, not, not as many um, exotic animals now as we used to, uh, but there, there's always the great day when I see that I've got a dog and a cat and a sugar glider and a, wait, what? <laughs> so I have to go back and review my anatomy and review my physiology because it's, it's all sort of the same plan, but every species has its, its unique characteristics. And so that, that keeps a pathologist on their toes. Thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim, for asking a question out loud. Anybody else can message me and, and ask a question uh, or have a question asked out loud as well, too. So um, this question is, um, what is collaboration like between students? Uh, and I'm going to say between students, you know, um, and then also between students and faculty. So if we can start with that. Um, and actually, I'm going to have uh, Dallas kind of talk about maybe the collaboration. I know anatomy is a huge uh, learning curve in their first year. So how do you guys collaborate and, and work through anatomy or, or any other uh, kind of subjects together? So I know right now, because of um, the COVID restrictions and everything, they have us in professional learning communities. And you're put in a group. And then that's a part of a subgroup of a, a bigger, a larger group. So as of right now, it's like, I, I think it can range from three to five of us. So in anatomy, you could be with three people or you could be with five people and they would normally have three to two students at a, at a specimen. And um, I know they want us, they want you to stay with that group outside of class and they want you to collaborate. But besides that, that's, that's mainly the way we're doing it. And that, I don't know about uh, Bianca and Kate, but that's how I've, um, that's how I started vet school. So 
I hope, you know, it's, it's kind of weird right now because we don't, you don't really know everyone in your class because they're kind of, you know, restricted to who you, because of contact tracing and who you want, you can see. But as of right now, it's, it's really worked out. I've met a lot of great people and um, a lot of great study partners and yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, Kate and Bianca, do you want to kind of talk about what what uh, collaboration maybe looked like before COVID, um, as well as, as what y'all are doing now? Yeah, we definitely um, had, we, we got to know our classmates really well. Um, I really feel for the first years right now, because um, like Dallas said, you don't really, we don't really, really, I've ne never seen Dallas before, honestly, um, just because we don't see each other anymore um, as much as we used to. And even this year, we, I don't see half of my class because of the way that the classes are structured. Um, but normally we'd all be in a classroom all together. Everyone takes the same core classes. So we're always together all the time. So you really, in an ideal world, get to know your classmates really well. Um, you quickly form your friends groups. Um, you kind of find who you vibe with and um, you have similar friends and groups of people throughout your entire vet school career. Um, and I imagine that the first years, it's even tighter groups now just because they are, have to be with the same people all the time um, in their labs and their classes. So, um, but again, in normal times, we have, you know, barbecues out in the trailer park. We have faculty versus students. Um, flag football games and hockey games and soccer games. Um, so I really, really hope that soon we can get back to that, um, especially for the incoming students, because it's just, it's so much fun. And um, you really do get to know everybody um, outside of COVID time. So I'm sure Kate probably has something to add as well. You pretty much nailed it. I know one of the questions was actually like, what are some fun things to do in Ames and the surrounding areas? And so you kind of like tied that in. Um, I do feel like with COVID, it's sort of changed the dynamic of how our socialization has occurred. And I do think that we are definitely lucky in that we got to know our class before this version of education happened. So I still, I was like, I think today was the first time I've seen Bianca in person in like <laughs> six months. Maybe. Um, but it's, there's an adjustment for sure. But I think that from what I've heard from other schools, there's actually a lot more things that we can do safely with social distancing. And that's really awesome. I feel like labs are, you know, well mitigated and whatnot. So overall, I, I kind of agree with what everyone else said. I feel like there's a lot of good collaboration within students. And then I feel like my instructors and my mentors are also more easily accessible now with COVID because we're all used to Zoom at this point. So rather than having to bounce around from office to office, I now can hop on Zoom and like, yes, there's a downside to that, but I feel like my collaboration actually with faculty is stronger because of my accessibility is increased with COVID. So that's at least anecdotally where I'm at. Great, thank you. And I think that that's a great kind of segue to talk about more, more about that relationship between faculty and students. So uh, Dr. Swami, I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about um, those uh, kind of mentoring and and especially during that first year, I know, which is a, a big transition. Um, how how does how do faculty members work with students and kind of collaborate that way? Yeah, it, it has been um, uh, quite challenging uh, year. Um, uh, hopefully, it will it will get better this year. Um, irrespective of um, you know COVID or not, um, we always. Um, try to um, collaborate with TAs and TAs collaborating with our students. So we have a really a large number of TAs, uh, about 15 TAs in, in the first year to help you guys when you start anatomy uh, class. And also what we have is after our support as well. So if you want to stay after five, five o'clock, so there will be a faculty member and also some uh, TAs will be around. Um, so you certainly can, um, you know, um, have an opportunity to um, talk to them. Um, and also uh, I introduced weekly uh, tutorials um, via Zoom. That is a, a, another, uh, you know, uh, advantage of COVID. I would see that as a positive thing uh, for student learning. Um, so we compensated whatever the students have lost due to uh, COVID restrictions by offering extra support. 
So uh, we will continue to um, collaborate with TAs and, and also um, with you guys when you start your course. Great. Uh, Dr. Fails Williams, do you uh, want to jump in and add anything, especially about that fourth year? Sure, sure. Um, so I guess I'd, I'd say for all things regarding COVID, um, I would imagine in five years we'll know how we should have done it. <laughs> but I, I think for what has happened so far, I've seen a lot of people just throw everything they've got at solving the problem. And we've come up with some really creative things. Um, things that we wouldn't have thought to do had COVID never happened. So it, it's been sort of a, um, nobody would have signed up for this, I'm sure, but some good things have come out of it. And uh, I, I do I do regret not knowing the first years on a, a first name basis at this point, because normally I would have by now. Um, but on the other hand, what I saw last year in the spring semester when I was teaching the first years, and then uh, when I had that class again as sophomores, is everyone's figuring it out how to support each other and support themselves. And, and when that figuring out process isn't working, then there's a lot of side support as well. So um, just a, a huge shout out for the resiliency and the grace that the students have shown, um, particularly as they, they had to live through me trying to figure out how to teach on Zoom, <laughs> which was a learning curve. So, um, so that, that's been a lot of um, really positive work going on there. One of the things that hasn't been shut down by COVID is uh, just, just as an example, I think it's next weekend or weekend after there's a talent show coming up. And it, of course it's modified and there's going to be Zoom entries and um, it, it'll be different than how we've done it in the past, but there will still be faculty foolishness. So um, that, that's still alive and well, and we can still do that by Zoom. So that, that's um, fantastic. Um, in terms of the fourth year, um, last year, there was a bit of a scramble to try to make that happen. And again, uh, everyone was doing the best that they could in, in the immediate situation. And so what that looked like initially was uh, a, a couple of rotations just didn't happen. So the end of the senior year uh, did not get to finish uh, their last couple of rotations. Uh, which was not really the way anybody wanted that to go, but that decision was made well above our head. That decision was made by the Board of Regents for the state. Um, and those veterinarians, they're graduates now and they're doing fine. They're, they're outstanding and, and it all turned out just fine. Um, but then over the summer, we started trying to teach by doing online courses. Um, so all, all, all clinical rotations were held online for um, the dates are a bit fuzzy for me now for some reason, but um, for some amount of time, those were done online. And then the faculty were doing all the patient care and all of the actual clinical work. And that was exhausting. And uh, that, that was not a long-term tenable situation. Um, so fortunately, we were able to bring the students back in mid-July, I believe. And the students started coming back doing clinical rotations which meant that the, the clinicians no longer had to do online teaching all day and then do patient care all night and then turn around and do all, all online teaching again. Cause that was, it, it's just, it was not feasible for that to happen. Um, and, and that's not what the students signed on for to, to learn their clinical year on Zoom. So, uh, and the good news is that's worked out really well. Uh, there's, there's been um, minimal risk for COVID transmission in the building. Um, so we've been, we've been very fortunate that way and everyone's been very dedicated to getting that done. Um, the rounds forms look a little silly now uh, because we've, we've spread everything out so that people are, are six feet apart, which means all the, the carefully uh, chosen furniture for a given room is now spread all over the room and there's tape on the floor. And it just, it, it looks um, not very organized, but it's safe and, and it's working and the students are getting that hands-on clinical expectation uh, completed. And so it's um, it's different than we would have ever expected, but it's working is what I can say about that. Great, thank you. Uh, so kind of a follow-up question um, to that then, kind of going off of that kind of faculty-student collaboration, um, and maybe Dr. Fails Williams, we can start with you. Um, how do you recommend um, establishing that relationship with faculty. So how, what's the best way for students to approach you to get that kind of collaboration or that mentorship? That, that's a great question. And um, 
you know, it always seems to happen one way or the other. And so that's been the great thing. Um, so one of the things that you'll start with is you'll be assigned a, um, a faculty mentor. And sometimes that's assigned based on your career interests, or sometimes it, it might be assigned by your background, where you're from. Um, you can make a specific request if there's a faculty member that you know you would like to work with. Um, other times you might be assigned to someone that you don't really interact with that much, or you just don't cross paths but you meet another faculty member somehow that you'd really like to work with. And you can always ask to, to either have an informal mentorship relationship, or you can um, request that you actually be transferred to that person. And, and that happens all the time. And as faculty mentors, um, we just want what's best for the students. And so that's um, either way works out that way. Um, I'd say if there's somebody that you know of either, uh, maybe you you know, we've, we've met them in a panel like this, or you've read one of their papers, or you happen to hear them talk at something, um, or they just look like somebody that you want to know, um, approach them, send an email, and just introduce yourself and say, hey, this, these are my interests, and I'd like to establish a more formal relationship. I will warn you that, and, and probably everybody, all the students on the panel could perhaps agree with this, that I've been horrible about keeping up with email this year, just because it, it just seems to be coming at me in, in, in all directions. Um, so if you, I guess the answer to that is if you don't get a response back from your faculty person that you've written to the first time, maybe give it a week or two and then send another follow-up because email seems to be just, it, it's never ending. And, and I always feel bad when I don't, when I know somewhere in the back of my mind, there's an email out there that I, I meant to respond to and I didn't. Um, I don't have a, I haven't figured out how to do that search yet. <laughs> search for all the emails I've missed. So, um, so maybe be a little bit persistent if you don't get an immediate response. But all of us here in the building are here specifically because we want to see veterinary students succeed and because we want to keep our profession populated by the people who are willing to do this and willing to put themselves out there. And so just on that alone, don't ever be afraid to reach out to a faculty member to hear more about their how they, they made their career choice. Um, you might be surprised if you ask most of us, very few of us would say that we woke up one morning and said, this is the profession I want to be, and this is the position I want to have. It, it's more of a, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, and, and we, none of us really have as linear of a path as we might maybe seem like we have. And I, I think that's always a comforting story to hear at any stage because um, it, it, it's, um, it's not like you're supposed to know exactly what you want to be when you grow up right now today. I'm still searching for that myself, so. So am I, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Kate, I wonder from the student's perspective, if you want to talk or if you want to add anything uh, to how to get connected with those, uh, those faculty members. Yeah, I stole Dr. Fails Williams for myself. <laughs> so actually, I'm, I'm very well aware with the process. Um, so I, when I first was accepted, I was like, I want a job in the hospital. And I know someone asked, are students able to work shifts in the small animal hospital if they have many years of technician experience? Yes, you don't even need the experience necessarily. They just need to have an opening. So when I first was accepted, I was like, I just want to get my foot in the door. I don't really care what department. And so I was hired as part of the barn crew at the equine hospital. I had pretty minimal equine experience, but I, I like knew my way around a horse. And so I worked the summer there and then I knew long-term that my interest was in pathology. So I kind of like put my feelers out and emailed all of the section heads in the VDL departments and said, hey, if you have a job opened up for a student, please let me know. I'm really interested. Um, I know that you might not have anything now because I don't see anything online, but just here's my name. And a week later, someone said, yeah, we had a student quit. Do you want a job? So it's really important to sort of be proactive. Um, you don't have to go bother every faculty member you're interested in, but just like that initiating of the communication is ultimately what helped me get my job. And then after that, even I've gone and said, hey, I want to do a project. Do you have anything? And they said, yeah, let's well, let's see what we have. And that's how I've gotten in on projects. That's how I was able to present at ACVP last year. Um, and then I've, you know, volunteered to help out with lab animal resources. And then at one point I was there often enough that they're like, do you want to be hired? <laughs> you might as well get paid to be here. So I think that just asking the right people and letting them know that you're interested really matters. People will attend rounds. They'll want a shadow. Like there's a lot of different opportunities to not just 
you know, get the hands-on experience, but also get paid for it potentially. So I, I think that that's one of the best ways to connect with faculty is just put yourself out there. Even if it's via email, even if it's from a distance via COVID or, Hey, I want to zoom just to like chat about what it's like to be an XYZ specialist. I think that's really important. So that's my two cents. And it's definitely benefited me to just put myself out there. And I, I am an extrovert, but even those introverts, as long as you are emailing and contacting people, you will find a spot. Great, thank you. Uh, does anybody, I don't wanna cut anybody else off from chiming in on that too. So now's your moment. Good, okay. Uh, so um, switching gears just a little bit, I know we have a, a question about summer internships, which I wanna get to next. Um, but I think asked uh, a little bit before that was what is the transition or what was the transition like for you from undergrad to vet school and Dallas if it's okay I want to start with you on that. Yeah that's completely fine. Um, I would say um, it was a big transition. Um, I'm not trying to scare anyone or anything like that but um, I, I it's it's going from, I, I, again, I don't know what everyone's background and their um, degree was in undergrad, but you're just going to get, um, there's just going to be so much. And what I, I was going to say later too, is that you just really need to hit the ground running and you just need to, you know, like Kate was saying in the chat, um, how you learned in undergrad might not work for you now because you might not have enough time, but I, it will work and you can do it. It's just, I think you need to prepare yourself a little bit before you start school. Don't just come in blindly and just expect it to work out. It's going to, it's going to be hard work, but I think, I think everyone in this chat is capable of doing it. So, yeah. Oh, uh, great. Thank you. Uh, Bianca, I know Kate uh, chimed in in the chat. Is there anything else, Bianca or Kate, that you uh, want to add to that? Um, yeah, I'll say that for me, I think the hardest transition was obviously coming from um, undergrad, masters to vet school is definitely a different way of learning. Um, but the hardest thing for me was just moving away from home. Um, I had never set foot in Iowa before I came here for school. Um, the only way I saw the school was through a virtual tour that Deanna did. Um, so it was it was hard. Um, my the first semester people tell you is the easiest I actually really struggled just because I was in a new place away from family um, I guess I should have mentioned I do have a husband here with me um, I forgot about him earlier but um, so he's here with me and our dog but um, it's definitely difficult it was a big learning curve for me to live on my own to balance school and personal life um, without really having much of a guide as to how to do it. You just kind of have to figure it out. Um, but there's so many people that are in the same boat as you, you kind of just stick together and get through it together and come out alive at the end of it. So um, yeah, it it's gonna be hard. I won't lie, but you'll figure it out. Great. And I wonder, uh, you know, Dr. Swami, you work with students kind of make, living through that transition. Uh, so what, uh, what do you think is maybe um, the key things in that transition from undergrad to, to vet school that maybe students should, uh, that you see from students kind of struggling with? Uh, I, I think um, uh, Dallas and uh, uh, Bianca uh, summarized their uh, own experience. Um, if I say oh, it is will be easy and it will be really, you know, it will be a smooth transition and don't worry, come, 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 come to Ames. So I will, I would be lying if I say that, <laughs> and I know you won't be believing that. Um, no, it is, it is really hard, really, really hard. Um, so th this is what sometimes students after any exams, um, students' expression is, oh, exam was easy. Uh, some some students would say, oh, exam was, was not that hard. Oh, it was very hard. So it all depends on how you have prepared for the exam. If you are prepared for a really tough exam, um, and then the hard exam or relatively hard exam would be, oh, it was okay, it was easy. So that mentality, so when you are coming to um, vet school, so be prepared that you are coming for the most challenging course um, or the degree that you ever did or 
you know, that is the type of mentality you should have and be prepared and come with the determination that you are here um, by choice, but not by chance, and I am going to get it done. So, um, so come with a positive attitude. That is, that's what I would say. Uh, you will certainly you will sail through. And I would just add, um, I think it's important to try and focus on the big picture. And as you're getting new information, um, there, there's gonna be a lot of detail. And I, what I see some students forcing themselves to try to do is to digest every single bit of detail, which you can't, you, you just can't. I mean, I would love it if you could, but I couldn't. Um, you have to remember that you learn in layers and you need to set up a framework for all those details to stick to. You're, you're gonna hear some of this stuff over and over and over again, sometimes in greater detail and in different context, but um, in, in every single lecture or lab that you're in, try and think about what the big picture is and, and what that lecture, that lab is aiming towards or what part of the big picture it's filling in because you have to keep perspective. And, and it would be great if you could just go into one class and into another and just pick up all those little details and it's all great, um, but it, it didn't work that way for me. And there's a lot of, I don't know that I did a lot of studying in undergrad, um, I probably did. I did a lot of note taking in undergrad, but I really studied in vet school where I, I left the classroom, left the building and sat down and tried to put all that stuff together because it doesn't just magically happen. Um, some of it does in your sleep. So make sure you get sleep. Um, don't don't forget or give up sleep for, for studying as a long-term decision making because that doesn't work very well. Um, but always think about where, where that lecture, where that lab is pointing you towards in the whole big scope of everything. Great, uh, great advice, I think, all around and great insight. Uh, so Bianca, I think you were sent a private uh, question, right, about summer internships. Do you want to read that off and, and maybe start our conversation there? Yeah, um, let me find it. Um... So the question basically asked um, if I had, or if we have job opportunities over summer breaks um, and if we can go home over break to work, um, the answer to both of those things is yes. So um, we already kind of talked about doing odd jobs around the school, which you definitely can do. Um, over summer break, you can basically do whatever you want. Um, I personally worked at a ER specialty clinic down in Des Moines both summers between first and second year and then second and third year. Those are really the two only summers you get in vet school. But um, so I got paid to work there the whole summer. Um, other classmates and people I know went to other clinics and worked. A lot of people go back home during the entire break and work maybe at their the clinic they worked at before vet school. Um, a lot of people do um, what we call summer scholars. So you'll basically pair up with um, a faculty member or a clinician and work on a project uh, research. And that's also a paid position and you get to present a paper at the end of it. Um, usually I did not do that, but I'm sure whoever's interested can definitely reach out to Deanne or one of the professors and they'll um, get you more information on that because I think it is a really cool opportunity if research is something that you're interested in. Um, and I have classmates that work, you know, ER shifts once a week or once a month or whatever it is, just to give an example, um, to make a little bit of cash on the side. Um, and if you're worried about having to work because you want to pay for school, I completely understand. Um, it's a worry that I think 95% of us have um, because school is really expensive, especially if you're coming from out of state. Um, you do get to take out loans and your loans do account for your living expenses as well. Um, it's not just for your tuition. So uh, for the most part, um, it's, it, it's not, it is a worry, but it's less of a worry than you think it is, if that makes sense. Um, there's definitely several opportunities. You, again, um, I think Kate was saying you do have to be proactive and kind of go looking for those yourself a lot of the time, but reach out to the clinicians here, the professors, they probably know somebody who knows somebody who needs um, a student to work for them over the summer. Um, and the vet community is a lot smaller than you think it is. So they might even know somebody in your home state that needs somebody. Um, so just ask around. Great. 
Great. Anybody else want to lend some lend some input on summer activities or, or programs at the vet school opportunities? Okay, there great. are some more research oh. um, opportunities as well. So uh, research programs, some labs, they do offer um, you know, research placements. Uh, that is a great opportunity. And also college-wide, um, there are some more research scholarship program as well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, okay, next question here, um, and I know I'm bouncing around in the chat a lot, but I'm hopefully getting to all of them in some sort of, uh, hopefully before the end of the hour, our hour here. Um, so somebody asks about, um, essentially uh, mental health and wellness. And I know Kate, you had put some information in the chat, but do you wanna talk a little bit more about uh, wellness here at Iowa State? Sure, I can do that. So y'all should read the message I put in the chat, but essentially um, if you have the school's insurance, mental health counseling is covered 100% by either community practitioners or at the school. Uh, for me personally, I come with a background of having mental illnesses, so I knew long-term that I wanted one-on-one -on -one therapy. So some people, it might be the first time that they're pursuing therapy or counseling of any kind, so you might start off one-on-one -on -one short-term at the school, and then if you're wanting to continue that, they might send you to a community person. But because I knew that, I kind of like skipped that intermediate step. Um, if you are needing like meds, you can establish care at student health, and so I feel like there's a very holistic access to wellness in general, whether that's medical or therapy. There's also the RSR club, which even with COVID has made adjustments so that people can interact safely. There's, you know, wellness focused groups within SAVMA. There's also a couple other groups that try to do wellness and care kind of on their own. I feel like with COVID, it's allowed us to get creative kind of with what that looks like, but at the very base of things, there's still access to care, whatever that looks like. There's a lot of really good resources out there if you're in crisis. Um, I don't know if there's anything else we should go over in depth other than what I had said. Honestly, our health insurance is one of the best when it comes to students. There are some vet schools that don't even offer health insurance, but the fact that mental health is covered 100%, it's very much worth it. Unfortunately, your student loans, like if you get health insurance through the school, like that cuts into what your living costs include. Um, so some people have health insurance through significant others or spouses that might have similar coverage just because there's not a ton of uh, marketplace insurance companies in Iowa, but it, it all depends. I personally have been on the Iowa State insurance since I got here and I've been really, really happy with it. Anything? Great. No, that, I think that's, okay. that's a wonderful starting place and we can kind of open it up to conversation too. Thanks, Kate. Uh, so anybody else, either students or faculty, want to talk a little bit more about kind of wellness here at Iowa State? Or maybe advice for students to, you know, <laughs> figure out that balance between classwork and, and all of that too, so. I'll just chime in that having the, so we have two part-time counselors here that are located here in the building and see students here in the building. Um, and that wasn't always the case. Um, it, before they were here, the counselors were located on main campus, which was fine, but trying to leave this building and drive over to main campus and get parking and, and get an appointment was, was a really big struggle. And in the situations where we had a student on, in crisis, um, you know, I've, I've driven students over to main campus in crisis and, and it works, but it's so much better now to have them here in the building and a lot of work, a lot of time was spent trying to make that happen. It wasn't, a, you know, I, I wish we could have just snapped our fingers and made it happen, um, but there were other things that had to happen first. But in the end, it did happen and, and those people are located here and I think that's a tremendous service. Um, it really makes things a lot easier. Um, and in terms of wellness, I, you know, our profession has to embrace a better understanding of wellness. The things that we did when I was a student, um, we, we didn't even use the term wellness. Um, we didn't, I'll just say we didn't choose healthy ways to relieve stress. We'll just leave it at that. Uh, so I, I think it's a much better situation. Now I see the students are organizing 5Ks and the students are organizing uh, a set of, of dance and yoga classes. 
in the evenings, um, which I keep meaning to participate in, and I haven't quite figured out how to, to do that yet. But the point is the students are really engaged in finding activities and ways to manage stress and to be together and to do things that are related to health. And it doesn't overtake your schedule. It doesn't, it's not an eight hour commitment. It's 45 minutes and a yoga mat. I mean, I should be able to do that. One of these days I will, but uh, I, I, that's just really an impressive thing because when I was a student, we just, we had no clue and we had no role modeling to, to try and achieve that. So it is taken very seriously here in the building. And, and I definitely see, um, you know, this, this last year has been incredibly stressful for everybody, for everybody, uh, top and bottom, um, all across the board. And I really think it's the, the level of wellness among the students that's kind of helped make this thing go as smoothly as it has, because um, I know that I pretty much ran out of my reserves of, of calm, cool, and collected by about, oh, August. So <laughs> it was the students that have been pulling us through. Uh, I will oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, you go. go for it. I was just going to say that um, somebody had asked also for advice for incoming um, first year. So no matter where you end up, um, I know I did this um, and you'll probably do it too, even though I'm telling you not to, because it's just how we are when we first come into vet school um, is you'll literally spend every hour of a weekend studying for that test on Monday or Tuesday. And you won't do all on the test because your brain can't take information and like that um so you literally and you'll hear it from all the upperclassmen like force yourself to stop what you're doing go for a walk reset watch netflix do whatever it is you need to do that's not school related because you'll burn out really really quickly um and i think that's part of the reason why i did struggle my first year is because i just and everyone kind of has their own version of the struggle um you know learning how to study and forcing yourself to take those breaks because you need it. Um, and it, you just get busier, unfortunately, with your classes, um, but you do learn how to cope with it and how to, um, you find what works for you as far as what, um, you, how you relieve stress. And I was about to say the same thing as Bianca was as far as taking time for yourself. And um, because the amount of information that's going to be thrown at you is just incredible. And it's, it's really amazing that we all do um, take it all in and, and learn it. But um, I would just, you know, take some time, do what you want to do. If it's just 15 minutes in between studying, take it, you know, and don't, I, there was, I've known um, some classmates that would, you know, study for 24 hours and then, you know, they would not perform the way they wanted to on a test. And, it really just comes down to, you know, getting, make sure you get the sleep you can, take a nap if you need to, um, but just really do take the time out of your day because it will feel like it's never ending, but um, I think the best thing you can do is take time for yourself and, and uh, it'll, it'll work out. One, one additional um, point I would add is, you know, although there are designated um, consultants or advisors so for uh, well-being or wellness, so all faculty members, all senior students, and uh, they, we are all like, uh, you know, uh, we are here to help you guys. Um, the only thing I, I, I noticed um, in the first year is, um, especially in, in the labs, since you guys will be learning in small groups, we can recognize some of you would be stressed out. So uh, invariably, especially those um, um, other students might have um, uh, recognized that we, some of the faculty members or TAs would spend more time on particular group or particular table. So just to give them support, just to boost them, just to help them to catch up with the material. So that is how we not only just be, we are here to teach um, and test you, uh, but we want you to succeed in, uh, in, in a positive way. So that is our, um, so we are not just teachers here. We are, we are also um, supporting your um, uh, overall growth. So that is our, uh, uh, our motto. And that is how we treat all our uh, students as our own, uh, you know, uh, kids in a way, uh, or family members. Um, so we recognize that at a very early stage and um, uh, some students are hesitant to talk. Um, again, we don't expect you guys to share your uh, uh, confidential things, but um, if you are stressed out because of the workload, 
uh, I would strongly advise you to talk to um, instructors or TAs um, as soon as you can so that we can help. So very often it comes at a very late stage and it will be really hard to uh, catch up. So um, recognize it quite early and please talk to us. Um, so we are here to help you. I'd like to chime in and say, oh, no, go for, go for it. Uh, okay, I'll just really quickly piggyback on that. That um, So I taught first year pathology for eight or nine years and I can guarantee you that we can predict what questions are coming up. Um, and if you have that question, if you're sitting in the lecture or on Zoom and you have a question, you don't wanna ask it because maybe that'll tell everyone else you don't know the answer and you're just assuming that everyone else knows the answer, I can assure you no one else knows the answer. Ask the question. Because I guarantee you, if you have that question, at least 40% of the room is asking themselves the same question. So ask it. Um, and that's all I wanted to say, ask the question. I just wanted to chime in and piggyback off what Dr. Swami was saying, because that was a, um, anatomy is a huge course. I mean, you learn a lot of stuff and I, I would really just strongly advise to take advantage of the TAs because sometimes, you know, the, the professors will be with other students. The TAs um, are really helpful and they, they can recognize what you know and don't know and help to try to fill in that information. I was lucky enough, I just got the email yesterday from Dr. Swami to um, be a TA next semester for um, anatomy. So if you see me in there, I am more than happy to help and I can do whatever I can. And the it, sometimes a TA might not know the question right away, but they go, go and do whatever they can. They go read a book, they come back, they, they will make sure you understand the information. And also when you come into that anatomy lab, there are, there's, um, there are gonna be kids that know what they're talking about and if you are if you have a question and it's after hours go and talk to another group and try to fill in the information that you have missing and just really make use of everyone everyone's here for the same thing everyone's trying to get the same degree so we're all here to help Great, thank you, thank you. That was wonderful, wonderful insight. Um, so kind of thinking about different ways to stress relief. One of the, or uh, relief stress, one of the question was questions was about fun things to do around AIMS. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Bianca first, because I know you and Kate came here with no or very little knowledge of winter, um, but Bianca, what do, you, what do you find here to do for fun? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think one of the first things we did was um, go out to the just the trails. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to spend time outside here. Um, if you're from a big city like me, Ames is a really small town. Um, it is a college town, but it's, it's pretty small. Um, so for me, I had to get kind of creative. So I had to spend time outside. Um, but it's, the weather, like I said, is really nice here. Um, during the winter, um, if you have never been through a winter, um, you'll get through it because I did. Um, there's um, Seven Oaks out in Boone, um, which is probably like a 20 minute drive, um, has ski slopes, you can snowboard, do snow tubing. Um, the vet school fraternity actually did a recruitment event out there a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago when the snow was still on the ground. Um, that was a lot of fun. Um, there's state parks everywhere. Uh, the closest one is also kind of over in that same area, about 20 minutes away, and it's beautiful out there. Um, we do have a couple of movie theaters. There's a lot of um, good local restaurants. Um, if you're into barbecue, there's a lot of good barbecue food places here. Um, and a lot of the time you're just hanging out with your, your vet school friends um, and the people that you meet here. Um, and hopefully we'll get back to the fun events that we had that brought all the students together because those were a lot of fun, a lot of good memories from that. Yeah, I think my, what I do for fun has changed just because of COVID, but I agree with Bianca that there's actually quite a lot in the surrounding areas. Both Bianca and I actually also came from large, much larger cities and then came here. And even though this is not technically a small town in Iowa for us, it was definitely a 
downsize in the just population. And so that actually has like kind of benefits to it because even like those trails aren't, you know, filled with people on the weekends and whatnot. So I've, I've actually quite enjoyed that. Pre COVID, I also, um, I'm a huge gamer personally. So I would do like, game nights with friends um i'm a video gamer as well as like board games and so i still do board games we do it via social distancing but there's you know the there's a bar in des moines called the up down where it's all arcade video games like i haven't been to the bars since before last march (laughs) but i do think that there's also a lot of things in the community that as it becomes safer to do that um i will there's axe throwing there's escape rooms there's anything you can find um if you're from a larger city though like it it is a a downsize it's not going to be the same but I haven't personally found that to be an issue I'm a golfer so I love having a golf course down the street it's very weird that it's closed for half the year because of winter for me being from the west coast because I am used to access all year round but I go out and do that I also go to main campus and participate in things um, going to the gym and whatnot there's a lot of actually things in the community you just kind of have to do your research and if you go in with an open mind, you'll find something. Absolutely. Anybody else want to chime in about, about fun things to do around Ames? Okay. I think that they hit it on, uh, they, they did, uh, did Ames proud on that one, right? Uh, So last question to kind of round out our panel here, and I know some of you have already kind of alluded to some of this advice or or put it in the chat or or whatever, but I would like just a little bit from you. So a lot of these students will either be coming to Iowa State or another vet school um, this fall. And so kind of what advice do you have for these students from now until that first day of the their uh, vet school career. So what kind of advice do you give for incoming students? And uh, let's see, Dr. Fails Williams, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, I'll just reiterate the idea that we learn in layers. And so give yourself a permission to pick up the big ideas and fill in the rest of it as time goes on. Um, so and if you're used to making 100% in all of your tests, that's great. Congratulations. Um, that's probably not going to continue <laughs> just because there's just such a high volume of information, not because you're stupid, not because you're not working hard. Um, so maybe if you can subtract the, your, your self-worth out of your grade or your test score and just look at it more as a sense of, okay, this is what I need to work on. Like, oh, clearly I, I understood this. This is great, um, but I need to work more on that. that that's the assessment or the message that we're trying to give back. But, you know, I, I'm a mom and I was a student once too. And I, I remember feeling those feelings when you see certain numbers or letters on the top of your, your exam. Um, so just focus on getting the big picture and you'll see a lot of this stuff again. Um, the truth is there's a whole bunch of stuff that I still look up. So that, that's the honest truth right there. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Swami, do you wanna go next? Yeah, I will um, um, just continue what what uh, Dr. Fels Williams has um, uh, summarized. Big picture, so keep that in mind. Some of you may get lost in details, so have a big picture. So I, I do re- reiterate that in my uh, teaching as well. Um, there are so many things to learn, but have a big picture. Think about what you should carry forward to your clinical practice um, to learn the um, you know I, I mean whichever the subject you take. Uh, I know you guys will uh, promptly uh, pay your tuition without being asked, but what we will be asking you when you join, your time, your mind and heart. So if you don't put those three together, um, you know, it will be really hard. So if you are willing to invest your time, you will get your returns, um, which will be directly proportional to your efforts. So that is the key message I would uh, uh, gave and another important message is there are no shortcuts. Um, so be prepared. Uh, just because we have uh, paid your tuition uh, means uh, it doesn't mean that we guarantee you to get a degree. Um, so be prepared for the hard work. Um, so we are here to give support as much as you want. If you go a mile, we will go extra mile of course, in the same direction, not in the opposite direction. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bianca, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, kind of go. I have something um, kind of non vet related. Um, but the thing that really stuck out to me, um, I think this might have been at the white coat ceremony my first year that just I think about pretty often it just stuck um, is that when you graduate, if you're first in the class, or if you're last in the class, everyone's still called doctor. Um, so when you're feeling like you can't do it um, because your friend got a much higher grade than you, um, you can, you're still gonna be, you're gonna have the same degree as that next person um, when it really comes down to it. Um, but my, my big advice for from now until you get into wherever you're going, um, especially over the summer, um, if you are able to, take the time off and do something fun. Um, I know I traveled a bunch before I came to vet school. Um, right now with COVID, it's kind of difficult to do that, but um, just if you can try to do as many non-vet related things as you, as you can, things that you enjoy. Um, when you get here, it's definitely possible to do those things, but it does become a little harder time-wise. So um, take your mind off of, off of vet school because um, you're in, you, you did the hard part. Um, so now you just gotta take care of yourself until you get here and while you're here. Great, thanks. Uh, Dallas, do you wanna go next? Yeah, sounds good. Um, I, the biggest thing I would say is um, what you're doing now, realize what works for your studying right now and also realize and, and bring that in, but also realize like Kate said, it might not work when you get here and you might need to change things up and work towards figuring out what works for you. My biggest advice would be is to um, sort of step back when you're, when you're in school and realize how cool this all really is. I mean, it's really, it's all really, this is what you're wanting to do for the rest of your life. So to take a step back and realize that I'm learning stuff that is now really important. It's not just an elective in undergrad. And I'm, I, and I think the way, the best way to think about an exam is, is that I'm learning something for the future and not what my grade is. I need, obviously you wanna get a good grade, but it's pretty much proportional to how much effort you put in and how much you wanna retain for the future. Dr. Swami will really make sure you know what's clinically relevant and, and keep repeating that. But um, I think it is really, you all made a huge accomplishment getting in and um, it's a really big thing, but take some time and realize that this is really, really interesting stuff and enjoy it while you're here. Great, thank you. Uh, Kate, will you, uh, will you finish this out here? Sure. <laughs> um it's okay if it's not for you is actually my uh, advice, which sounds super contradictory to say to like the incoming class of 2025, but I've watched people get here and realize that it's not for them and then feel like their whole lives are failures because they've come to that realization. But at the end of the day, it's better to recognize that in yourself to be honest and true with who you are rather than to pretend like it's fine. And so I did, I know classmates who left because they realized that it just wasn't for them. And that is not a personal reflection on who you are. Just like getting a bad grade isn't a personal reflection of who you are. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. So I think it's just really important to be open and honest with who you are as a person and knowing if you need help or you're struggling. I have gone to 3 a.m. calls where my friends are in crisis. I have also been the one who's called someone in crisis. I've you know, done a lot of different things where I've thought, you know, what do I really want to do in this field? What can I do to make a difference? And for me, that's getting involved with larger organizations, doing student government, graduate and professional student senate while I'm here, because that's what keeps me going. So I think just being patient with yourself as you kind of explore what being a vet student means to you, because you've never done this before in theory, and it might be scary. You might not even know. And that's why I think it's important that if it's not for you, that doesn't mean you're a bad person. It just means you didn't know it before. And once you got here, you figured it out. So just be patient with yourself and roll with it and be honest that you should be happy no matter what, even if it's not in vet med. So that's my soapbox. I like it. Okay. 
Well, I want to say thank you to the panelists. You know, one of the questions I get um, most often from prospective students is what sets Iowa State apart? And it's insight like you just heard. It's the knowledge that you just heard over the last, you know, a little bit more than an hour that I think sets Iowa State apart. It's our faculty and our students. It's our community here that sets Iowa State apart. And so I, I feel privileged anytime I can sit on a, uh, you know, sit in and listen in to uh, you all give awesome advice and uh, expertise. So thank you all for being here uh, with our uh, alternate and admitted students today. Um, I'm gonna let you go enjoy the beautiful day. <laughs> Hopefully everybody has a chance to get outside and put the books away for a little bit uh, today. But thank you all so much for being here. Um, if you do, so if you have follow-up questions, students who are on today, um, if you have follow-up questions and wanna get connected with these folks, I'm happy to connect you uh, by email um, as well. So I know, I think actually Kate put her email address in the chat um, to, to kind of contact her directly, but I can contact or I can kind of connect you all too. So, um, so thank you all to our panelists. We now have about a five minute break before we come back and talk about tuition, financial aid, scholarships, and, and all of that. So, oh, awesome. More emails are going in the chat. So uh, anybody who's listed there, just feel free to contact them directly. So thank you all panelists. I'll let you uh, head out. And like I said, we'll get going here in about four minutes now at one o'clock central time um, with that financial aid session. So. All right, hello everyone. Um, as Deanna said, I am a financial aid advisor here and I work with students who are prospective or current in the Vatmad College. And so what I'll be going over today is specific to financially planning for your upcoming year, um, as well as what to expect for cost. And then if you have any questions, of course, um, put those in the chat, um, those will be monitored. And um, this session is recorded. So you are welcome to reach out to me via email as well anytime after the session if there are questions. Let me go ahead and do screen share here. All right. So if you do have questions after the session, um, sorry, it will be best to probably shoot me an email. Um, my email is listed there, vmfinancialaid at iastate.edu. That will be the quickest way to probably get a hold of me um, to have your questions answered. And you know, even if you are waitlisted or you're still trying to decide what school to attend, I'm happy to answer any general questions, even if you've not made a, a decision yet or heard back from Iowa State University on your position um, coming in. But to start out, um, since all of you are possibly coming from different schools, I know we may have some ISU alums here. I do like to cover just the basic financial services overview at Iowa State so you know who to contact if questions come up. Financial services at ISU, of course, includes the Office of Student Financial Aid, where I work, and the Office of Student Financial Aid and myself help students with FAFSA filing, understanding loans, the loan action steps, some budgeting, and then helping our graduating seniors plan for loan repayment. Our partner office on campus is called Accounts Receivable, and Accounts Receivable at your undergrad school may have been called a treasurer's office or a bursar's office. They are the office that manages your bill, and they also work with students who are planning to use a monthly payment plan to pay or perhaps have a college savings plan, and they also release financial aid refunds to students. So if you have any questions about paying out of pocket to your bill or just your bill in general, the accounts receivable office will be the best office to talk with about those questions. The office of the registrar at Iowa State assesses your tuition and fees. They also determine residency. And if you are a student who is a veteran or a dependent of a veteran and have benefits to use, the office of the registrar will work with you on certifying those benefits. These are the three main offices that most students will interact with at Iowa State. And again, since this uh, PowerPoint will be available after the session, you'll have all the contact information for who to contact, or if you are unsure, just shoot me an email, and then I can always get you to the right point of contact as well. I also listed um, the college on here because College of Veterinary Medicine administers scholarship awarding. You will notice that I did not include that under the Office of Student Financial Aid where I work because I do not work with the scholarships. 
Um, I help students with the loan steps, loan action steps, um, but scholarships are separate. And if you have any questions about scholarships, it will be best to check your supplemental website that you log into or just continue to monitor your email for any updates from Iowa State. Um, and additional information, I believe, will be available um, later in the session about scholarship opportunities for first-year students. So next, I'm going to move into the cost of attendance. And the cost is what to expect for your first year at Iowa State. Now, this cost is for the currently enrolled students, and this could change next year. Board of Regents for the state of Iowa finalizes tuition and fees for Iowa's three public universities in June every year. So it is possible these amounts could change in June 2021. Presently, though, resident students who are from the state of Iowa um, have full-time tuition and fee assessment for the year of a little over $25,000. Non-resident and international students are closer to $54,500 for the year. And again, on that prior slide, I included the contact information for the Office of the Registrar. So if you are a non-resident student and you feel that you have established residency in the state of Iowa, you can contact the Registrar's Office to ensure you are assessed the resident tuition and fees. Or if you have questions about establishing residency in the state of Iowa, the Office of the Registrar can help to answer those questions. All first-year students are also required to purchase a laptop, and this is automatically billed on your university bill in the fall semester. This laptop is required for your participation in the program throughout the four years you are at Iowa State University, and the laptop amount is currently $2,550. The student or faculty panel may have addressed the laptop. If not, you're welcome to share any questions in the chat or monitor your website where that you log into for any questions about it um, or for additional information about the laptop that you are required to purchase. So the laptop tuition and fees are considered your direct billable expenses. These are expenses you will incur at Iowa State University for one year. For resident students this year, it's around $28,000. Non-resident students, closer to $57,000. Now, financial aid is also required to include out-of-pocket expenses. Out-of-pocket expenses include housing and meals, books and supplies, and then just other personal or consumer expenses you may incur while you're in school. Now, a lot of students um, will choose to live off campus for a number of reasons. And so you are not required to pay housing and meals on your university bill unless you are contracted through university housing or purchasing a meal plan. A lot of students, though, are doing this out of pocket on their own. Same thing with books. You may have options on where you buy your books. And then out of pocket expenses are expenses that you would incur over nine months, regardless if you are in school or not. This is not a bill. This is not necessarily how much your exact out-of-pocket expenses will be, but your financial aid cost of attendance is required to cover these expenses for you for the first year, as well as your subsequent years to follow. So whenever you get your financial aid offer, you'll see that your cost of attendance as a resident student is a little over $41,000. Non-resident and international students will have a cost of attendance closer to $71,000. But remember, that's not a bill. That's just how much financial aid you can use for one year. To receive financial aid on an annual basis, we do recommend filing the FAFSA every year. Now, many of you may be familiar with the FAFSA for your, from your undergraduate program, or this may be the first time you've ever filed a FAFSA. There's always a March 1st FAFSA filing deadline if you are applying for the Health Profession Student Loan. Otherwise, the FAFSA can be filed anytime after March 1st if you are not using the Health Profession Student Loan. Scholarship information um, for the first year is determined by your application for admission, so you do not have to complete any other scholarship applications your first year. In future years, there will be one application for all scholarships. That information will be available to you after the school year starts and the deadline to apply will also be announced during your first year. So the nice thing is it's one application for every scholarship. And again, this first year, no additional applications are required. In future years, you will have to apply for scholarships. And then finally, if you are planning to use student loans, you will need to ensure that you've taken the appropriate loan action steps to have loans applied to your bill. Your financial aid offer that includes your loan options 
as well as scholarships if you are selected for a scholarship is expected to be available late May. Your financial aid offer will include your loan action steps, and we recommend completing all loan action steps by August for the fall semester and December for the spring semester. You're never required to accept the loans offered to you, and loans can be accepted, reduced, or declined anytime during the semester. Loans you borrow are repaid after you graduate or after you stop attending half-time. If you borrowed loans for your prior degree or degrees, those loans will enter a deferment status, meaning payment is not required once classes begin in the fall semester. The types of loans available to students in a professional program include the unsubsidized loan from FAFSA. This does not require parent information. The PLUS loan, which also does not require parent information and is a credit-based loan from FAFSA, and the health profession student loan, which is a need-based loan from FAFSA and does require parent information for consideration. The type and amount of loan you are offered will be included on your financial aid offer. The unsubsidized loan amount is up to $40,500 for the year. If you are a resident of Iowa, this nearly covers your full cost of attendance. If you are a non-resident student, this will come short of covering your cost of attendance and non-resident students are usually then looking at the plus loan option to cover their remaining expenses. The origination fee and interest rates listed for these loans of 4.3% and 5.3% respectively are for the current school year. Interest changes by congressional action every July 1st, so the interest rate could change for the upcoming year. If you are offered the health profession student loan, it will be a no interest loan while you are in school and will remain no interest 12 months after you graduate. The amount varies by student since it is a need-based need loan um, and the amount offered can vary year to year as well. The loan action steps to secure these loans, like I said, will be listed on your financial aid offer and the loan action steps are completed online. On the next slides, I'm going to show you what these action steps or what to look for in Access Plus will look like if many of you are new to Iowa State University. Now, if you are admitted and you are attending in the fall semester, the information I'm going to show you next will also be shared at orientation over the summer. And again, shared on your financial aid offer. But I do wanna go ahead and go over the overview of how to understand the online website that Iowa State University students use to understand their financial aid and specifically complete their loan action steps. Access Plus is a portal that students log into to view their bill, their class schedule, and also the primary thing for students in the veterinary medicine college is viewing their financial aid offer and their financial aid action steps. All students have a financial aid menu option, and one of the options is specifically called financial aid offer. Now, I know this is small on your screen, but this is just an example of what your financial aid offer could look like once that's available to you later this spring or early summer. It will break down your cost of attendance at the top. And like I said, that is not a bill. That's simply how much financial aid you can receive for the year. Below that, you will see the types and amount of financial aid offered to you. So for this example, there is a small scholarship offered, the unsubsidized loan, and then the graduate plus loan because the student is a non-resident student. Any action steps required to finalize student loans will also be listed in Access Plus. There are additional menu options where you can accept, reduce, or decline the loans offered to you every semester. And then any other first-time loan borrower steps or application links will be listed as well. So Access Plus is the best place to complete your action steps online we will also include these action steps on the financial aid offer that is mailed to you. Students who apply for the health profession student loan by March 1st are required to complete something called FAFSA verification. FAFSA verification simply means the health profession student loan has to verify your financial need by collecting additional tax information or a parent or student verification form. FAFSA status is a great place to go to ensure we have your FAFSA at Iowa State University, as well as any action steps required to finalize your FAFSA. Now, if you are selected for FAFSA verification, you likely received emails from the Office of Student Financial Aid with the action required. 
The action steps can likely be completed online in Access Plus, or you are welcome to call or email the Office of Student Financial Aid for clarification on any action steps you need to complete. FAFSA verification is the process that takes the longest to complete as well. Since the loan action steps are online, they go through pretty quickly. FAFSA though takes longer. So if you were selected for verification, ensure you allow at least three to five weeks for the documents to be processed through both Iowa State University and federal student aid before your FAFSA is verified. Given this longer processing time, you must turn in all documents by July if you are planning to use financial aid for the fall semester and you want that financial aid dispersed on time. If documents are turned in after July, we cannot guarantee timely disbursement of your fall semester financial aid. Additional action steps to, cons to con uh, consider as you are planning for your first year of veterinary school are to budget for how you're going to plan to pay your relocation expenses. Your fall semester financial aid will not disperse until one week before the fall semester begins. That means we cannot pay you early to move to Iowa State University, so you do need to plan to pay those out-of-pocket expenses on your own. I also recommend determining how you plan to pay your consumer bills that you know you're going to incur while you're in veterinary school possibly without loans if you can avoid that option. These types of bills include car payments, transportation expenses to and from home, like airline tickets, or outstanding credit card bills that you are still paying on. Anything you can do to reduce or minimize your consumer debt will help you live a less stressful financial life while you are a student. Um, as you may have heard from the other panels, you'll have a lot of other things on your plate and certainly minimizing any expenses possible will hopefully allow you to have a more smooth um, transition to Iowa State um, and a more smooth time at Iowa State University knowing you can make ends meet. I also recommend um, creating an emergency plan of how you plan to pay any unexpected financial hardships that may come up while you are in school. So let's say your vehicle has a catastrophic malfunction or you get in a car accident or something like that happens and all of a sudden you have these huge out-of-pocket expenses you may not have been expecting. Have a plan in place, if possible, on how to cover these expenses. Do you have a savings account built up? Do you have an emergency credit card? Or are you already in talks with perhaps a friend or family member that like, hey, if something comes up, can we work out something where I could borrow some money and pay you back? It's best to have those plans in place before you get to school, hopefully, hoping that you never have to use them but knowing that you have that plan in place. So if something happens, you're like, okay, I know what to do. I know I have options here because that is certainly a stressor that no one needs and certainly not you guys going into a professional program. In terms of financial aid action steps, we do recommend filing the FAFSA. If you've not already done so. So you have the unsubsidized loan and plus loan options available. And then once you are familiar with Access Plus or you have a chance to log into Access Plus, definitely get familiar with the financial aid menu option. Um, on there, like I said, you can check your FAFSA status. You can view your financial aid offer likely as soon as late May. We will also mail that to you. And then you will use Access Plus over the summer to complete your required loan action steps. We recommend completing all loan action steps by the end of July for the fall semester though those steps could be completed any time after you receive your financial aid offer. That's all I have for my presentation. So I'm going to do stop screen share here. And it looks like we may have had some questions come up. Let's see, I think Diana, you may have answered some of the questions. I, I answered the one, yeah, about applying for uh, scholarships uh, right. for the fall, but I'm wondering um, if, if you know kind of what are some options for international students um, mm -hmm. since they're not able to use, use FAFSA? Yeah, so that's a great question. International students are um, required to verify at the point of application that they have the financial funds to pay for the four years they are here. Um, some international students though have been able to secure private loans in the past um, with a U.S. creditworthy co-signer or possibly a loan from their home country that could help finance their education. Um, but otherwise, unfortunately for international students, it's usually self-pay or trying to secure a private loan that is credit-based. 
do you see very many scholarships from that, uh, you know, that are awarded to uh, international students or? Uh, as far as I know, um, the scholarships offered through the college are available to domestic students so students from the United States, as well as international students. And so they're in the same pool as everybody else um, with the same options and consideration. In terms of outside scholarships outside of the university or outside of the college, I don't generally see many for domestic or international students. Um, so yeah, it's not unfortunately um, a large pool of money for the international students as they're in the same pool as everyone else for scholarships. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, question here, and it says, are there uh, subsidized loans then for out-of-state students? Sure, the only subsidized loan option for graduate or professional students in any type of a program is the health profession student loan. Um, that is a no interest loan option. Yeah, that's one thing that's a big change from undergraduate years to graduate or professional years is the loss of the federal direct subsidized loan and then grants as well. Um, so health profession student loan is no interest, but a lot of students have found it to be somewhat prohibitive because it does require that parent information. Um, a lot of students are older or independent and may not want or be able to collect parent information for that loan, but that is currently the only option. Great, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, another question is, my FAFSA was already submitted without parent information. Can mm -hmm. I amend that FAFSA um, right. if I want to apply? Yes, that FAFSA can be amended. Um, so yes, that, I'm so glad that that question was brought up. Um, yeah, you can log into your FAFSA to make changes, um, to add parent information. I would say do it sooner rather than later. Um, that way we have a chance to get it and then can contact you, the student, about completing verification as soon as possible. But yes, that can still be added. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this question uh, is, I've been doing some research and it looks like you are unable to apply for in-state tuition if you are in school full-time, is that correct? I'm gonna say yes, just blanket yes. statement. Um, yes. So if you're from out of state, will you always pay out of state tuition. Yep. Unless there's another way you establish residency. And the only other way that I'm aware of that a student has established residency midway through the program is through military affiliation. Okay. So because they were military affiliated, um, they were able to gain residency for that reason. But that's the only way I've seen it ever happen. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Question here says, um, how do I make a decision by April 15th, which is the vet med due date, mm -hmm. uh, if financial information won't be available until mid-May? So can okay. you talk about a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, what I do with the financial aid offer just includes the loan options. And so all FAFSA filers will be offered unsubsidized loan plus loan if you're a non-resident student. And so those amounts are, they are what they are. Um, anyone who files a FAFSA is getting offered those types of loans. Um, health profession student loan does take a little bit longer to be determined, but that amount is also significantly less. Um, so I don't think any students have used that as a deal breaker in the past, um, more so with scholarships. Um, and I unfortunately don't know the scholarship timeline and when those are announced, um, but that would be the main thing. Um, if I were a student to be mindful of is hearing about scholarships, knowing that if you're a FAFSA filer, you'll get the loan options no matter what. Great, thank you. Uh, and I know Dr. Ramirez is back with us and and I know he works very closely with scholarships um, as well as Kathy does. So I am gonna invite Dr. Ramirez to chime in whenever he'd like as well. Um, but from my knowledge, most of are the, um, the scholarship, uh, the scholarships, you know, we try and get those out before that April 15th date so students can make an informed decision. Um, but sometimes depending on who declines their offer, sometimes there's, you know, a little bit of flag time. But uh, Dr. Ramirez, I don't know if there's anything you want to add about that. Yes, thank you. So I'm, and I was going to talk a little bit about my section, but I think it fits very well here. So uh, as mentioned, uh, what we do is we look at your application information and gather the necessary information. So if you apply to Iowa State, you're applying for all our scholarships automatically. Okay, as it was mentioned, our international students uh, do not qualify for any scholarship that's, that has a financial need. 
Okay, so if a donor says, okay, I want to give it to a student with this characteristics and financial need, if you're an international student, you would not qualify because the only way we can certify financial need is through a FAFSA form. Uh, but if, it, if the scholarship says nothing about financial aid or financial need, uh, then that can become available for all students, including our international students. Um, in regards to our scholarships, what we do is we have a, and it's, it's really a small number of scholarships that we call recruitment scholarships. These are scholarships that are usually in the amounts of $10,000 or more, maybe are repeatable. Um, so what we do is for our bigger scholarships, um, if you get accepted, at the time of acceptance, within a day, you will get a notification that we're not only accepting you, but this is the scholarships we are providing you to help make that decision. So if it's a, a scholarship that might help you change your mind financially, we do that right away. Um, the rest of our scholarships, so we probably have 300000 about $300,000 available for incoming um, VM1s. Um, the rest, a lot of our scholarships, we wait until our class is formed, and then we go and designate those back to those students. And, and those, um, you know, a lot of those scholarships are one-time deal, maybe $8,000, maybe $5,000, maybe $1,200. Uh, since they're really not the decision makers, we wait till the end so what we have our class formed so that we can better pick based on the criteria of the donor out of those that are already coming to Iowa State. So if you're applying um, and you get an acceptance, if you get an acceptance with a scholarship, that suggests that that's one of our bigger scholarships we have available. Um, if you're applying and you don't have a scholarship tied to it, it doesn't mean you're not getting a scholarship. It just means that that decision has not been made and will not be made till after pretty much the class is formed. Um, but likely that scholarship amount is to help support you and probably not a big enough amount that would be critical in that decision making. But we do have quite a few scholarships we, we provide for the incoming uh, students. Great, thank you. That helps a, a lot with kind of uh, understanding timing and, and all of that. Perfect, thank you. Um, so still on the topic of scholarships, but I think Tara, you're probably gonna uh, be able to answer this, um, hopefully a little bit more completely too. So this student was given a scholarship uh, for first year veterinary students, and it says it was given to the school for tuition and fees. Can they use that then uh, for things like book purchases or the purchase of the laptop? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's an Iowa State University scholarship, yes, absolutely. Um, the only time that there would be restrictions is typically if it's military affiliated funding um, that does have to be allocated in a very specific way. Um, otherwise, yes, that can usually be applied to any other charges. Um, I've not had any issues with that in the past unless it is usually military affiliated. Great. It looks like it was a Iowa 4-H scholarship. So yeah, no problem there. Yeah. Great. Fantastic. Uh, so I want to make sure that any other students who have questions about uh, FAFSA, tuition, uh, financial aid have a chance to, um, to ask those. Remember, you can always let me know if you have a question that you want to ask out loud as well. Um, but and while I'll they're stay on, you say, yeah, and I'll stay on through Dr. Ramirez's sections, and some of that will kind of do a little bit of crossover too. So I'll be monitoring the chat as well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, Tara. I appreciate that. So yes, if you post a question in the chat after we transition here to Dr. Ramirez, uh, Tara will be in the chat to uh, kind of make sure that um, those are those are asked and answered as well. So. With that, then, thank you, Tara, for being here. Um, it's always nice to feel like I, we've got our heads wrapped around <laughs> financial aid and tuition a little bit more. So I appreciate your time. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Dr. Ramirez to talk to us a little bit more about scholarships and, and career planning and all of this stuff kind of beyond vet school, too. So. Take it away, Dr. Ramirez. Perfect. Thank you, Deanna. 
So again, and as you can see, Terra's great, really helps us a lot with the financial aid and just the, the, the finances overall working out. So, so we appreciate having her close association with the vet school because she knows vet students, right? And that's one of the key things for us is have people who can help support you as a student who know the uniqueness of our program compared to undergrads. And she does a fantastic job. So um, career opportunities are huge, right? One of the things in veterinary medicine is they're just so diverse what you can end up doing, right? Um, sometimes even people ask me, you know, I'm in academia, I do some teaching, I do research, I do administration, um, I do some service, right? And sometimes I'm like, are you a vet? Uh, are you a real vet? Or can I talk to a real vet, right? Uh, my degree is, um, you know, I have several degrees, but my veterinary degree makes me a veterinarian and the role I serve as a veterinarian is so diverse, right? So you don't have to work with a particular species. Um, I happen to work primarily with pigs, um, students and pigs, good combination. Um, some of that came just by chance, right? So one of the things I tell you, although you might have your particular interest in small animal, or zoo or equine, often our vision of our future is based on what our experiences have been. So what I strongly recommend all students when you come to Iowa State is be open-minded. We have a lot of clubs, we have a lot of experiences and get exposed to things. I really didn't get exposed to many pigs even though it was Iowa in vet school, right? Um, I was more thinking cattle and actually, when I graduated, I was still thinking cattle, maybe a little bit of pigs, uh, but then end up shortly after I started practice in Northwest Iowa in private practice, getting almost exclusively into pigs. I did mixed, and then within a few years, I was doing swine management and a lot of things that I would have never thought of, right? Um, and even today, I would have never thought I would have been back to academia much less thought that I would have even been back to be part of the administration, right? So keep your eyes open. Um, often I say the students might have experience, let's say an equine, they work with pigs and they're like, oh, I love pigs. I want to be a pig veterinarian. Then they get exposure to dairy calves. It's like, no, no, now I want to be a dairy veterinarian. Um, and then they get exposed to some other species and no, I want to be this, right? And a lot of that is because again, our profession and our training is so diverse. And that's one of the things I really like about Iowa State is we prepare veterinarians that are awesome and well-prepared in all species, right? Uh, our program is on the foundation that really makes you well-prepared. We have veterinarians who are in charge of aquatic centers. And obviously in Iowa, we don't have an aquatics program per se, right? We don't even have, any oceans nearby, right? Where we're, we're landlocked. Uh, but that same foundation of anatomy and all that prepares you where after graduation, you might need to just do a little specialty here to, to kind of get caught up in your species of interest if it's not one of the usual common ones in the area and still be able to be extremely successful in that area and well-prepared. So, so keep those options open. And that's what allows our students by the time they graduate to be kind of in high demand, as it was mentioned, Dean Grooms mentioned, you know, our salaries are pretty good. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and also those opportunities or those offers. So um, if I was asked, if I was to ask right now, I'm going to open the chat. Here it is. But if I was to ask um, to you, um, how many of you love animals, right? You, you would all be raising your hands. Um, but I think if you really think how humans, right, and this is worldwide, have really changed the perception of animals over the years, right? Um, if I ask you how many of you consider um, your pets to be part of the family, I'm sure you would be raising your hands, right? Um, if I ask you, can I see your phones and your pictures? you probably would have tons of pictures of pets, right? Or horses or pigs, right? Those animals that you really love and enjoy. Um, hate to tell you, but if I ask your parents to see their phones, I'm sure they'd have maybe more pictures of their pets than they'd have of you too, right? Uh, but that's important because in our profession, 
those are the animals that people love and those are the animals that we will have the opportunity to work and serve. So I think our future as veterinarians is secure. Um, you know, over the years, people looked at veterinarians who um, used to be in charge of taking care of the horses for the military. All of a sudden, when, when the army quit using horses, they're like, okay, that's it. We don't need veterinarians. Well, no, veterinarians adapted and started working with livestock, food animals, right? Even when tractors and all that came, they're like, yep, there we go. We don't need veterinarians. Then we moved to small animals. Now we move to exotics and all things. So really the need for veterinarians continues to grow. In my office, I oversee some of our job placement. And I can tell you there's weeks we might get 50 requests for people looking for veterinarians, okay? So the demand right now is huge. There's just not enough supply of veterinary medicine. And I think that is very helpful for you as you're trying to secure. We talked about the cost of education. That's important, right? There's some high cost, but when you look at business, there's two parts to the equation. One is cost and the other one is income, right? Can I offset some of that cost with a higher income? And uh, I do teach a veterinary entrepreneurship course here at Iowa State as an elective. <clears throat> and one of my colleagues, Dr. Cole Camp, does an exercise with the students where they kind of do the calculation of, is it worth being in veterinary school? And I think in the end, including those for out of state, when you offset your income potential versus the cost of education, it still pays off as a good return on your investment. So before we get into scholarships a little bit more, if you go to our homepage, and if you go to students and future DVM students, there's a career planning here and then we'll go under placement, okay? So I'm gonna copy this and put it in the chat for everyone. So you can follow if you want to, but this is some of the information that we help provide you and everyone out there ahead of time. So you better understand what you're getting into because Definitely there's some costs associated with veterinary medicine, but we want you to be successful and make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. If you're in for the money, the reality is the wrong profession, okay? You can make a lot more money in other professions, but if you're in it for the love and be able to have a good paying job, this is the right profession for you, okay? Now that means you will still need to make some sacrifices, right? You'll go through undergrad, as you go through vet school, you have to kind of be careful with your budget, right? Not overspend, be prepared, uh, set your expectations. You will have some debt when you graduate, probably the first couple, three years, you can't just go from eating all the instant ramen uh, to graduate and having steak every night. Right? I would love to drive a Ferrari, but you can't just graduate and go buy a Ferrari. Right? If, if that's what you're anticipating for success, you're setting yourself up for trouble. But you can actually set yourself to know that by the time you graduate, a couple, three more years of being reasonable, you can then have a very enjoyable life that can take care of the expenses that you need to um, and look forward to a profession that really fills you, not necessarily just from a financial standpoint, but what the things you can do as, as a veterinarian. Most of our students, one of the questions I have, where do you expect your salary to be within the next five years after graduation? Most of them are going to be looking at trying to make over uh, six figures, right? So you can do that. This website gives you some of that information. We try to be transparent, right? This is based on six months after graduation, what our students report. And this is a class of 2019. The 2020 is being summarized right now, but you can say at that time, the class of 2019, 98% were employed right after graduation. Some of the ones that are not employed are some logistical things. Some need to take time off because they started a family. Uh, some of them are kind of waiting for their spouse to kind of finish an additional degree before they move. So there's other reasons and maybe why they have elected not to be uh, going to a job right away. 
If you're looking at salaries, this is again the class of 2019. You can kind of see these are the median salaries based on what the students report are straight coming out of veterinary school. Okay, and these are for averages and, and you can see some numbers here and it does vary a little bit by state, right? And it varies based on what you're doing. So here's some additional resources. And then you can kind of see some salaries right here, some of that range, right? Um, you can see some salaries that are lower, right? But that these are not adjusted. So we have some individuals, some of our colleagues who graduate who prefer to work part-time, right? maybe half time, maybe less than half time uh, for whatever decision they would like to. Um, so these are the median, it's right here for private practice. Um, I can tell you those numbers for 2020 were higher um, for the class of 2020 based on what I'm getting the feedback, you know, was probably closer to 75 or a little higher than 75. Uh, from what I hear <coughs> from my current students that some of them already have jobs um, it's even bumping a little bit higher than that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sometimes our data is not 100% truly represented. You can see based on numbers, you can see the food animal went down. That's just a kind of a little bit of a fluke situation there. Uh, but we do see a lot of our food animal salaries to continue to, to, continue to rise. Um, I know in the swine area, we have uh, quite a few students that um, are almost close to the six figure uh, right at graduation. So it kind of varies a little bit based on background. And again, setting your expectations, right? Um, I think as a profession, most of us will know that by the time you graduate on a full-time job, you're probably going to be working more than 20 hours a week. We all recognize the life work balance, but uh, we also recognize that the hit by car dog tends to show up on Friday afternoon at 4.30 or 4.45. Uh, so we got to stabilize it even if there's a referral clinic. So most of you should be expecting maybe closer to a 40, uh, 50, maybe up to a 60, pushing a little bit, uh, but definitely a little bit of a, a few more hours there that you can expect. So this gives you a little bit of background, published information readily available for all of you. And then the scholarships, right? So you have the debt, the scholarships we talked about where our Dean has been very proactive in growing our scholarships, right? If you look at the numbers he showed, you know, fiscal year 2013, we were at 400 and what was it? 426,000. Um, here we are for what we're projecting to give out this year to all our students is 1.3 million, above 1.3 million. So almost a, more than threefold increase in that availability of funds, right? So again, great value, uh, great opportunities. And our goal is to increase that to 2 million here very short. And what's important is we have that support from the Dean because the Dean kind of decides as somebody's trying to donate money, where some of those priorities and our current Dean groups has been very proactive in recognizing that we need to help support our students. So as it was mentioned, those scholarships, we try to make it easy. So the scholarships we have control over, which are the scholarships where the money comes into Iowa State. Your first year, like it's been mentioned, we just take your information from your application, right? No sense in making your work extra. After that, once a year, we have a application process and it's one application and you apply for all scholarships. So it asks weird questions sometimes because, you know, can you draw art or something like that? Uh, do you play an instrument or do you have vocal, right? Some of those are certain requirements that different donors say to give priorities. We take all that information from that single one-time application and we have a committee of faculty that then go ahead and allocate scholarships based on the criteria from the donors. So make it very easy for you. We also keep you posted of scholarships that occur outside of Iowa State, right? The 4-H scholarship that was mentioned. The Greater Des Moines has one for women sometimes. Uh, the Merck scholarship sometimes outside. The uh, ADMA scholarships. So all those scholarships, we keep you informed on where those are and that you can apply. But those that we have control, we try to make sure that we make that process easy for you because your time is valuable and we don't need students 
spending too much time to apply to 10 scholarships. We should all make everybody equally applicable. Important thing to remember in all those is your PASPA, right? Fill out that PASPA. That PASPA is very important because any scholarship that says and financial need, we have to have a FAFSA in order for you to be able to qualify for those scholarships. So expectations, again, I think um, somebody who deals with a lot of this, I think you will make more money right after graduation, after your veterinary degree than if you went straight, right, from a uh, bachelor's. Um, I think that extra income offsets what your student loans are gonna be. Um, that doesn't mean those student loans are nothing. I mean, they, they will be a burden and they will hold you back in the context of you got to make some payments, but it's doable. Um, I think the future of salaries is going to continue to grow. Um, I think uh, I also, for my entrepreneurship course, I have a banker who come in and veterinarians are a great um, lender from the perspective of the banks or lendee, right? Banks like to lend money to veterinarians because they pay their bills and there is uh, a good opportunity for income to generate. So there's opportunity for individuals who get into small animal, mixed animal, large animal to be able to purchase their practice and significantly increase their income post-graduation. So it's all doable, um, great opportunities. I think Iowa State is probably the best school that prepares you from a completely well comprehensive rounded program. Um, food animal, you're not gonna find some of the prepares you as well for all species in food animal, but it's not just food animal. Our small animal students, our small animal faculty are just phenomenal. Um, they can compete against any student in any other institution, right? So we have the advantage that we prepare our students overall for all species to the point where once you graduate, you have a lot of opportunities to follow your dreams and pursue the career that will really help you be successful, happy, um, and earn a good living with that. So that's some of the information I have and I would love to um, open it up to any questions that uh, we can answer. Great, thank you, Dr. Ramirez. Uh, so I have a couple of questions surrounding the kind of decision or recruitment scholarships you had talked about before. Yep. Um, so first, can you talk about uh, talk about some of the criteria that's used to select uh, students for those scholarships? Yes, so, um, so um, almost all our scholarships have a criteria by the donor, right? So the donor sometimes tells us, I want a, somebody who is interested in small animal, or I want somebody who's interested in rural practice. We have a few scholarships for recruitment where we have flexibility, but most of them, there's a particular criteria. The, the probably the biggest criteria I would say is for what we call our recruitment scholarships, are individuals that say we want the we use the ranking from our academic programs, you know, for admissions, and then we use that additional criteria. So they might say, you know, we are interested in a student who is interested in a rural practice. So we will actually have everybody ranked and, and what their interests are based on your essays. It takes quite a bit of time. Look at your essays, look at the things that you establish, and then we look through that and establish. Where's the student that meets the, the first student based on our ranking of our admissions process? Where do they fit into that criteria? So those are our big ones. Um, some of those, right, we do a bunch right now. Um, some of those that maybe get declined by some of those, uh, will that get passed on to this next round of students that we will be electing. So just because you're not in that first round does not mean you will not get one of the big scholarships. Actually, Dr. Ramirez, you read my mind. That was the sec that was the next question. <laughs> um, so yeah, they were just wondering, you know, are you at a disadvantage to receiving one of those scholarships if maybe you're on the alternate list? So yeah, so uh, so right now for those that are waiting, um, if you're out of state, that um, there's still some of those that will be offered to that next tier. Absolutely. Um, not as many, right? Uh, but they are some that do, will, do come out to that next year. 
Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so another call, another call for questions for Dr. Ramirez or for uh, Tara Joyce here. Please feel free, like I said, to put them in the chat or uh, come off mute and ask those questions um, directly. I know I, I got a direct question that was about um, how do you recommend finding and matching with another first year student um, for a roommate? Um, and so um, I don't know, Dr. Ramirez, if you have any uh, insight. I know we do have a housing website, which I'm going to put in the chat. Um, that's a great place to look. Also, when you're admitted, you'll get uh, invited to a Facebook group. Um, so if you have Facebook, you might want to get on there and kind of try and uh, connect with uh, students that way. But I don't know, Dr. Ramirez, if you have any other insight. <laughs> yes. So so, so if you, um, those have been the ones that are the most successful is um, as that group is being formed, which will occur, you know, here short, you know, sooner than you think. Um, as that group is formed, that Facebook group allows people to connect with each other. Uh, one of the challenges we have in, you know, as a situation, right, is we can't let everybody know who else has been accepted, right? Um, even if I write a letter of recommendation for a student, uh, my own office can't tell me whether they accepted that student or not, right, because of privacy rules. So what we try to do is if you're interested in finding a roommate, there are opportunities through likely, and maybe Kathy might be on the, can help us, but usually you can send a note to Kathy or Dr. Howard that helps with a lot of our process. And then they might help spread your contact information to those who, who have accepted um, us trying to look for some of those opportunities for roommates and all that. Yeah, absolutely. We try and help out as much as we can. Um, you know, that's kind of uh, our, mode of operation right is to to help out as much as we can to give you good resources um but yeah i would i would say yeah utilize the the message board that admissions message board and then uh the website and and facebook um if you're admitted uh for that too so so great what other 